we're getting closer to a point where we might actually see cuts this year. We're still looking for easing now to begin in September. The Fed put is still alive and well in people's minds. A more credible bear case would be a reacceleration inflation. If it's not a trend down, in fact, it is just inflation hanging out where it is, then I think they keep postponing. Is the inflation target the right target? We all talk about wanting to go back to 2%. 2% is totally arbitrary. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Perro, Lisa Abramowitz, and Anne-Marie Hordern. Let's get your week started live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, and what a week ahead we've got for you. NVIDIA earnings just two days away. We'll go through some expectations a little bit later this hour. Coming into Monday, building on four weeks of gains on the S&P 500, the Nasdaq, and on the Russell 2. We're picking up on the scent of capitulation over at Morgan Stanley. Mike Wilson has a new year-end price target, 5400 the old price target, 4500 Bramo, the quote, a wider range of outcomes and opportunities. And he came on this show and talked about the fact that it's getting harder and harder to have any kind of broad assumption of where this market is headed. A lot of different analysts have been really head faked by the idea of uh, a lot of differing cycles that are kind of overlapping and prolonging this recovery. Mike Wilson's going to catch up with us tomorrow morning, so don't miss that conversation. That's just around the corner as well. Of course, that upgrade follows Deutsche Bank and Binky Charda lifting the 24 forecast to the top of the firm's range. AMH looking for 5,500 year end. Yeah, looking for that. And I think the biggest data point we're going to get this week that's going to really decide at least the direction, the short term for the market is going to be NVIDIA. But going back to that Morgan Stanley note, Jonathan, I loved this quote. In short, macro outcomes have become increasingly hard to predict as data has become more volatile. That has been the theme on this show. There, everyone comes on and they're finding it very difficult to decide where we are in this cycle and where we're going, you although S&P higher. You mentioned the data point of the week is NVIDIA on Wednesday. Second division U.S. data is the quote coming from Kitchuk of SockGen, just to squeeze that in. Existing home sales, you Mitch, inflation expectations and durable goods. Second tier data. So we're light on data. We're heavy on Fed speak. Here's the calendar. Bostick, Mester, Barr, Waller, Jefferson, all in the next 24 hours, Bramo. Looking forward to some of this. Yeah, meanwhile, over this week, we've got Bostick, Barkin, Barr, Will, uh, Waller, Williams, as well as the ECB's uh, Christine Lagarde and a whole host of others from the ECB. To me, I'm looking at this and saying, what can they say that's new? And to me, actually, Chris Waller might be the most interesting because he's going to be talking about our start. He's going to be talking about that long-term idea of inflation. That's where they got to go now. Because right now, I don't know what else they can say new because right now they're talking about data dependency. Well, we can't read data to Anne Marie's point. This has become a really confusing moment that Morgan Stanley's Mike Wilson has been grappling with. They seem willing to talk about normalization, but reluctant to talk about what normal actually is. So hopefully they entertain that idea in the next couple of days. Here are the scores for you on the S&P 500, just about positive by a tenth of 1%. In the bond market, yields look a little something like this, unchanged at 4, 41.39. And in foreign exchange, Bramo, 108.70, going into a week full of second tier data and big <laughs> earnings release. Second tier data and second tier uh, central bank speak. Can you say that? Because the ECB speak is going to come out and we talk about what's going on with the euro. We've really been looking at this idea of an ECB pushing back some of their expectations. Wednesday to me is the big day because we get also Fed meeting minutes. We also get $16 billion of 20-year bonds being auctioned off at 1 p.m. It's going to be amazing. We get all of that Fed speak. NVIDIA, I just want to put this stat out. 12 months ago, NVIDIA's share price climbed 20% on the results. And since that day, it has tripled in value. This is a, a stock that single-handedly can change the dynamic. To me, Wednesday is going to be the key moment. And NVIDIA could be a much bigger driver and first-tier data very much for, uh, front and focus. Yeah, Jim Reed at Deutsche Bank said the same thing this morning. Look out for that on Wednesday. Coming up this hour, we'll catch up with Steve Chevron of Federated with markets coming off four weeks of gains. Terry Haynes of Pangea Policy on the death of Iran's president and Abigail Watt of UBS ahead of another busy week of Fed speak. We begin with our top story. Equity futures building on four weeks of gain. Steve Chevron of Federated saying, quote, the word right now is fine. Economic data has come in slower, but fine. Inflation is stickier and higher, but fine. Earnings have been fine. It all comes to continue to keep our base case scenario in play. An economy that remains stable and rate cuts that eventually come. Steve joins us around the table. Steve, good morning. Good morning. A fine morning to you, sir. Fine indeed. Everything's fine. Is that a good thing? I think that's right. I mean, I, I think you've got a Wall Street that's waiting for something to break hard in one direction. And the story is, is that it's fine. Bulk of the probability is inflation that is grinding slowly lower and growth that is also 
softening but not troublesomely. And so it's fine. It's a fine environment for bonds. It's a fine environment for cash. And it's a fine environment for stocks. Is it fine that you've got company, a lot of company up here? That makes us nervous. Um, you know, when we came out with a 5,200 target for this year, that was the high on the street, you know, back last September. And it's not anymore. Um, and so you do start to ask yourself a question. Are any of these things going to break harder than you expect? Is inflation going to reaccelerate? Is growth going to slow more than you think? And I hate to say it, but right now, it's fine. Um, it's moving in the directions expected, but not outside of the range of an acceptable move. Things are not fine for Red Lobster. <clears throat> Things no. are not fine for a number of different companies that are really struggling with higher costs, fixed leases, the idea of labor that's been going up. Is everything just fine at the index level? But does it justify actually expanding into some of the less loved areas? Or do you kind of stay with that just fine along with everybody else consensus? No, quality matters because you do have rates that are higher for longer and that puts pressure, right? That's going to put pressure on weaker credits. It's going to put pressure on weaker companies. Slowing growth does the same. You see the same thing on the low end of the consumer. So it is fine at an aggregate level, but there's pressure that the weakest players are having a harder time um, withstanding. And so I think as an investor, you've got to make sure that you're buying quality. That means higher quality credits, better balance sheets, better cash flows, because there is going to be some weakness and volatility on the weaker end. What are you actually doing? Are you just looking at your portfolio and saying, that's fine, and then checking out? No, no, no. What we're doing, I think, is we're, we're really questioning ourselves. And John hit on the point earlier, because so many people have moved to a bullish kind of positioning, and it's less lonely up here is what we've kind of talked about, we're questioning the assumptions. So when you look at that retail sales number last, last week, is that just a little softer or is that the sign of real consumer stress to come? Credit spreads, we're watching those on a weekly basis. You know, two, three weeks ago, they looked like they were moving higher, but then they've kind of come right back down. So we're, we're constantly questioning this fine assumption, um, but, it, but nothing's violating it at this point. And so I think what we're in is a kind of old normal expansion right now, where it's higher rates, a little bit higher growth, a little bit higher inflation, and that's enough for equity markets to grind higher. Does your house view of one or two cuts this year maintain? Yeah, we're st I think we're probably more towards the one than we are the two, just because the growth has been a little bit stronger. I, I, I will say, certainly the retail sales number and the jobs number you know, puts two potentially back in play if we continue on that trend. But generally speaking, we think it's one or two. And one, we think the gulf between one and zero is huge. Because even if it's just one, the market will start to price in that we're in a cut cycle. And then we think you'll really start to see broadening out as people try to get ahead of that. And what do you think that is? How much, like, what's the data you would need to see to put two, potentially one before the election, labor firmly market. in play? It's labor market. I, I think for this Fed, you know, June is probably not in play. I think that probably leaves July. I have to imagine they would like to avoid September, November if they, ha if they can. Um, and so the whole idea of either July or December, but certainly December. Let's go through some quotes that we've got on the south side. One from Morgan Stanley and Alan Zetner. This bigger, not tighter economy allows the Fed to start cutting mm. rates in September. Our conviction on three cuts this year remains high. Steve, what do you make of that quote? This bigger, not tighter economy allows the Fed to start cutting rates in September. Do you share that view of the way this economy is performing this year? I think you've got to be careful with inflation because once you get past <clears throat> June, July, the year-over-year -year comps get difficult. And we're still running at about a 4% annual rate over the last three months. And so three to me is tough. It's <clears throat> why inflation is going to come down, Lisa, which I think is really important. Peter Shea of Academy writing over the weekend, if inflation continues to come down, it is likely to be tied to a weakening economy, which should be good for bonds but not so good for stocks. It's working out why inflation from here will continue to come down from three, perhaps down towards that 2%. And this has been sort of the question all year, right? People have been looking for how much are we going to see a weakness accompanied with this inflation, or are we still looking at the lag effects from the <laughs> pandemic? I know you're laughing, but this is what some people are saying, that this is just sort of year-over-year year comps. What I find interesting, and, and Bank of America's Michael Hart really went through this, this idea of a very loose fiscal policy with a restrictive monetary policy. And if you have fiscal policy that starts to tighten, if, it's a pretty big if right now, then what happens with monetary policy and does that sort of ignite some weakness? I think this sort of goes to the heart of the uncertainty of the moment is that we don't understand the crosswinds of two policies that frankly are at odds with one another. Steve, final word if you can on that. No, I think that's right. <clears throat> I mean, you have 
a former Fed chair running a monetary policy that's very different than the current Fed chair. Um, I, I think you have to get special dispensation to have a general run the Department of Defense. We might want to think about getting the same thing for having a Fed chair run Treasury, because you do have competing kind of monetary policies almost coming out of there. And I think that is the stimulus that you've seen has certainly buoyed small businesses, the consumer, the inflation impulse. And it's one of the reasons why I think so many uh, of folks that are looking at this from a macro perspective have had a tough time over the last 24 months. Steve, months. you've got some company. Let's put it that way. I do. It's good to see you, buddy. Thank you. It's great to catch up. Thank you. Steve Chevron there, uh, federated on the latest in this market. Equities at the moment just about positive by a tenth of 1% on the S&P 500. With some news elsewhere this morning, here is your Bloomberg Brief with Danny Berger. Hey, Danny. Hey, John. President Biden came face to face with campus protests this weekend. The president gave a commencement speech at the historically black Morehouse College in Atlanta. Biden called the situation in Gaza and Israel heartbreaking and that he's working around the clock to get more humanitarian aid into the region. Several students and at least two faculty members showed solidarity with the Palestinians during the ceremony. Recent polling does show that significant numbers of young and black voters disapprove of President Biden's support for Israel in its war with Hamas. Nippon Steel is stepping up efforts to gain support for its takeover of U.S. Steel. Nippon is sending its vice chair and executive VP to Pittsburgh this week to meet with local staff and elected officials. It's also sending technical teams to review U.S. steel mills. They're hoping to find ways to boost investment and labor commitments to try to win over union leaders. Nippon declined to comment on the details. Now, birdie on the final hole was enough for Xander Schauffele to clinch his first major golf title, winning the PGA Championship at Valhalla. Schauffele finished with a major record 21 under par, beating Bryson DeChambeau by one shot. After being arrested before play on Friday, world number one Scotty Scheffler finished in a tie for eighth. And that is your Bloomberg Brief. John. Hey, Danny, thank you. We'll catch up with you in about 30 minutes' time. Congratulations, Xander. Just a fantastic performance from start to finish for the whole weekend. Up next on this program, Iran's president killed in a helicopter crash. It's a shock event in one of the most important countries in the region, but the immediate geopolitical implications may be quite limited, assuming that Iran does not blame outside countries or forces for this death. The latest out of the region coming up next, live from New York City this morning. Good morning. Live from New York City, equity futures right now on the S&P 500, positive by a tenth of 1%. Yield just about unchanged on a 10-year, 441.79. And in the commodity market, we're down a half of 1%, 79.68. Under Savannah's this morning, Iran's president killed in a helicopter crash. It's a shock event in one of the most important countries in the region, but the immediate geopolitical implications may be quite limited, assuming that Iran does not blame outside countries or forces for this death. They're unlikely to significantly change Iran's foreign policy orientation, but it is still early days and we don't know what is going to happen in terms of the blame game. Well, here's the latest. Iranian news agencies have confirmed the country's president, Ibrahim Raisi, and foreign minister have died in a helicopter crash. Search teams located the wreckage in Iran's mountainous northwest region. The chopper went down on Sunday in an area covered with dense fog. Bloomberg Horizons Africa and Middle East anchor Jumana Basechi joins us now for more. Jumana, talk to us about the latest coming out of the country this morning. Yeah, good morning, guys. Well, it took us a while to get full details of exactly what happened yesterday. Late in the evening, Iranian state TV declared that the president had been involved in a quote-unquote hard landing situation with the helicopter. It took another 12 hours for the emergency rescue services to actually reach the site of the crash. Only at 6 a.m. local this morning did they manage to get access to the helicopter site, after which it emerged that, indeed, the Iranian president, Raisi, in addition to the foreign minister, were one, two of the nine passengers on that helicopter. All of them died 
in the crash. Uh, shortly afterwards, five days of mourning were declared in the country. And what has happened in terms of who takes over the vice president, Mohammed Mokbar, is going to take over tentatively as a tra transitional president per the constitution. But as per the procedure, the country needs to hold another round of presidential elections within 50 days. It should be stressed, though, and I think this is key, and this is this ties in to what uh, the prior guest was saying, that ultimately the decision maker in the country and the ultimate power still lies with the Ayatollah, with the Supreme Leader. He was quick to put out a statement yesterday saying uh, that there will be no disruption in the country's affairs, even if it is confirmed that the president has died. He put that statement out yesterday. And of course, it did emerge that the president was killed in that helicopter attack. So yes, it is a quite a, a, a shocking sequence of events for the country. But the messaging from the Supreme Leader, from the Ayatollah, is that it is business as usual. The public, however, may see it differently because, of course, the backdrop to all of this is Iran is undergoing a deep economic shock. Inflation is running close to 35 percent, and they're really being weighed down by the extent of these sanctions that are being applied to the country right now. Jumana, when it comes to the Supreme Leader and the Ayatollah, Raisi was an individual that potentially was going to be a top contender. Where does it leave potentially that succession? Because Ali Khamenei is 85 years old. And that is the question, Marie. And I think, you know, if you put it like that, the pathway to becoming the supreme leader is becoming president. And the assumption from the outside world is that President Raisi was on that pathway. He was seen to be very close to the Ayatollah. He was seen as a conduit for uh, many of the more conservative fundamentalist policies that the Ayatollah wanted to apply. With him out of the picture, it leaves one person in mind, and that is the Ayatollah's son. Uh, so that is potentially the next person who could take over. That is Mushtaba Khamenei. But again, it all comes down to what the clerics within uh, the Iranian Guardian Council want to happen. And this also bodes, uh, you know, questions and raises questions about the upcoming presidential elections and which are the candidates that are going to be vetted by that Guardian Council in order to run for these presidential elections. Back in 2021, when Raisi was elected, there were no other people who were allowed to run against him turnout was very low. It was only 50 percent. So who they decide to run as candidates for the president election could be a reflection of how they're thinking about a potential successor to the supreme leader later on. Jumana, appreciate the update. Jumana Basechi there out of Dubai on the latest in the region. Terry Haynes joins us now of Pangea Policy. Terry, let's talk about your reaction, please, sir, to what took place over the weekend. Uh, in addition to what Jumana already said, uh, I would add uh, only that uh, of, of course, geopolitical risk is elevated uh, still further by these deaths, but that uh, the impact could be quite limited because uh, in the Iranian system, uh, what matters the most is the uh, is the supreme leader first, and secondly, the proxies are generally run by the IRGC and not directly by the uh, by, by the president. Uh, so, in terms of uh, Iran's outer facing. Uh, activities. Uh, I expect that to be uh, virtually unaffected. That said, it's sort of there's this question of can you walk and chew gum at the same time for a number of different countries in a very fraught region right now, given the fact that you're going to try to be trying to come up with a new president, potentially even hold elections in 50 days in Iran at the same time that there's huge dissent in Israel, uh, given what's going on with a war plan or lack thereof. How do you see this wrinkle as affecting what's going on right now and the tensions right now, essentially between Iranian backed uh, groups and Israel? Well, it's going to make uh, it's going to make Iran uh, essentially double down on its own stance. I think uh, for the next couple of months, anyway, as you point out, that 50-day uh, bogey in terms of a, a, of a new election is very is very important, uh, and they're going to go out of their way to uh, show that it's it's basically business as usual. Uh, at the same time, uh, you've got a. a, a a brewing crisis in Israel's government with uh, with many senior figures in the government, including uh, the effective deputy Gantz, uh, saying that they need to see something from the government sooner rather than later by early June about a, uh, a plan uh, to deal with Gaza post-war. Uh, so you're looking at a situation where for the next uh, the next very few weeks, uh, the the the, uh, the the puzzle pieces are 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 you know, more thrown up in the air even than they normally are. 
Terry, we see this administration have to spend a lot more time in the Middle East than they had planned to coming in. We had Jake Sullivan in Saudi Arabia and Israel over the weekend. Any signals from those trips that potentially they are closer to striking either this defense security pact between Saudi and the United States or even normalization with Israel when it comes to Riyadh? Well, I think uh, just the fact that they're over there a lot uh, says positive things about the, the, the possibility of that, uh, generally speaking. It's very much in the administration's interest to want to uh, want to put that, that, that together. Uh, they thought, uh, Netanyahu thought, the Saudis thought, uh, even before uh, the, the war started, uh, that they were down the track on this. And, and so I expect them to re redouble, their, uh, redouble their efforts. I think the... Uh, uh, the physical presence in, uh, of United States officials uh, makes that pretty clear, and it's very much in uh, very much, of course, in the United States' own interest to make sure that that happens. Terry, your note that over the weekend is really talking about the election and also the debates coming up with foreign yeah. policy continuing to be, you know, top of the headlines every single day. How much are the debates going to focus on that, and who do you think the voters give better credit to when it comes to foreign affairs? Well, I think it. Uh, I think the debates uh, will feature foreign policy rather more than uh, than most people expect. Uh, the buzz in Washington usually is that uh, domestic issues uh, take over. That's certainly uh, that's certainly very much uh, on on top of voters' minds. And at the same time, uh, you know, one of one of Biden's top pitches is that uh, there is that he's working hard uh, to create a safer world. One of Trump's top pitches uh, is that Biden's actions have, have contributed to making the world more dangerous. Uh, so I'd expect it to be a bigger piece of the uh, the debate than most people do. Terry, can we just finish on your base case come November and whether your confidence levels around that base case over the last month have got greater or worse? Uh, my base case remains that I think uh, the president is reelected barely and that what we end up with is a split Congress. So for, in terms of markets, that means, among other things, uh, continued non-attention to fiscal debt and deficits, uh, but a largely unified foreign policy as well. Um, yeah, that said, my uh, my faith in that uh, you know gets a, a little bit narrower uh, most days. Terry, why is that? Um, just too many, uh, too many issues. I mean, a lot of uh, a lot of it, which is beyond the White House's control. Uh, but at the same time, too, uh, the, the fundamental issue I think is uh, the, to this election isn't any of those issues. It's really whether the president still got it. I mean, whether whether or not the uh, whether or not the cognitive issues are real or not, he's going to have to demonstrate that and continue to demonstrate that. Just what the attorney general did last week in taking a non-privileged conversation and, and trying to assert executive privilege over it shows you just how sensitive the White House is to that. And it actually, in a backdoor way, sort of validates it. Hypersensitive. Terry, thank you, sir. Terry Haynes there of Pangea Policy. The latest polls, not great. The latest one around Arizona. Not tremendous either. Arizona and around Florida. And the whole idea here was that potentially abortion would be on the on the ballot for Democrats. But the issue we're seeing at the CBS poll over the weekend when it comes to Arizona and Florida is that actually there's more concern about inflation, the economy and also immigration. How does he turn that around, Bramo, between now and November? I don't think anyone knows. I think he's hoping the, uh, the debates will do something uh, to try to draw some contrast with the former President Trump. I thought this poll was really interesting. An NBC survey last month found that interest in the election is at an all-time low ever since going back to 2012 and had declined since September. So people basically are looking at this and getting less and less interested and more and more disconnected. The hope of the president is that as we get closer to November, they become more interested and they lean towards him, which is one of the reasons, I think, why they were pushing to get that first debate in early June. They wanted to come back into the households of the American people. They wanted to be on their TV sets. They wanted to remind, I think, the American people of some of the rhetoric that you saw a lot of independents really have issues with when it came to the former president. So they're going to move up that debate because the numbers are showing that Biden has to get out in the public and make his pitch. That's the latest on Washington and the Middle East. Coming up on this program, big moves in the commodity market. Gold and copper surging to all time highs. Kona Hack of ED and F Man joins us next from New York. This is Bloomberg.
Equity Futures here, just about positive to kick things off Monday morning. Good morning to you and welcome to the program. On the Nasdaq, we're positive by 0.2, following four weeks of gains on the S&P, on the Nasdaq and on the Russell 2. Looking out for NVIDIA on Wednesday. Price target upgrade coming out of Barclays this morning, 1100 from 850. All signs still point to another revision higher. How many revisions higher have we had from NVIDIA over the last 12 months? That's been the story of why we've seen its valuation triple in the past year. I mean, this has been a, a moonshot and could really direct a lot of the approach of the entire market, the tone of the entire market. But what I find interesting is what you've seen under the hood is, yes, you've seen some of the big tech names uh, regain some of its dominance, but you haven't seen the momentum trades take off in the same kind of way. There has been a shift under the hood in the rally that we've seen. NVIDIA up in a pre-market by around about 1% so far this morning. Let's turn to the bond market, two-year, 10-year, 30-year. 10-year yields down for three consecutive weeks. We've been pulling back over the last few weeks. Your 10-year at the moment, 4.4179 on a two-year lease of 4.8180. Light on economic data, I think AMH called NVIDIA the data point of the week. And I think a lot of people, even in bond markets, might agree with that. The fact that people are talking about the Fed's meeting minutes from the May 1st meeting tells you all that you need to know. The fact that that's the big data point, I think NVIDIA, I think is fair to say, will probably be better than that. I will say, just taking a step back, there's a real question of how far the Goldilocks can go and whether the couple of softer than expected prints economically and a Citigroup economic surprise index that's been falling and at the lowest level in about a year, whether that speaks to true disinflation that's sticky or whether this is just sort of another head fake. That disagreement you can feel in all the notes over the weekend. People are not on the same page with that. Take those lower yields. Lisa mentioned that surprise index as well. Take the data relative to the estimates and you've got a weaker dollar against the euro. Last week on the euro against the dollar, this currency pair, biggest weekly gain since March. Lisa, close to 109, 108. 74. All of a sudden, maybe the disinflation narrative is coming back. And at the same time, you have a European Central Bank that even the hawks are coming out and talking about the potential for a June rate cut. I wonder how far this goes. How many notes did you read over the weekend talking about emerging markets as this new bet and this sort of reflation trade? Again, a lot of crosswinds. It's early days. And I think Kit Jukes and the angst that he puts out every morning really sort of solidifies it, where he's saying yeah. basically every day, don't get too excited. It's not going to get that exciting. Every single day, maybe we could talk about a new trend, but nope. Not going to do it. Seems to be where we're at. It's a challenge to peak exceptionalism. At least we're asking that question. And Peter Chair of Academy has been fantastic at that. Under Savannah this morning, your top stories. This out of Iran. President Ibrahim Raisi killed in a helicopter crash on Sunday. His death, along with that of the foreign minister, was announced by state media early this morning. Raisi was widely seen as a candidate to become the country's next supreme leader. And Anne-Marie, we're working out who's next. Well, that's the big question. It's less so who takes over as the president. It's more so who's in line to be the next supreme leader, which really is the decision-making power within Iran. And the thinking was always it was between Raisi and Ali Khomeini's son. And now with Raisi's, Raisi's death, it does seem like potentially the one individual that could take over for Khomeini, who is 85 years old, is going to be his son. The tricky part of that is that... Iran never wanted this to happen. They overthrew a monarch, and then they would be going back to that. So that is a very tricky frustration. Potentially, we could see some of that tension. That's the medium to long term. Can we talk about the short term, just operationally, how things are set up now? The RGC reports to the Supreme Leader, so who oversees the military is not going to be affected here. It's going to be, what, 50 days before we get another election and in between we get the vice president? Vice president. So if you look at Article 131 of Iranian's constitution, which I did over the weekend, and then Khomeini came out, came out and said, we will follow this. You have the vice president that will have a caretaker government. And then within 50 days, they will call for an election. But to Jumana's point earlier, you had Raisi standing alone in that election. So, quote, unquote, an election will be taking place the next 50 days. Much more on this story coming throughout the program. Any additional headlines, of course, we'll share that with you. Here in the United States, focused on the central bank, the Federal Reserve, plenty of Fed speak on tap today. We're going to hear from Bostick, Barr, Waller, Jefferson and Mester. Later this week, we'll also get the Fed minutes as well. Weekly jobless claims and the UMIS consumer sentiment survey. When you are light on economic data, Lisa, I think you always run the risk of putting too much emphasis on the data that we will get. And that data is very light this week. 
I would say the fact that you said University of Michigan sentiment survey, and then you started to warn about the unreliability of this data. I just want to point, it is shifting from 100% phone to 100% online. So if you thought that it was unreliable before, <clears throat> excuse me, it might be getting even more so. I agree in terms of where the mood is shifting. That said, I do think ongoing commentary from the likes of Macy's and Lowe's and Target this week, even though those are maybe second tier names and the second tier data points, will give us also some color in the consumer following on what we heard from Walmart and whether that downshifting at Walmart's gain is everybody else's loss, as we've talked about. Michael Gapin is talking about the minutes, though, this week potentially being important. He says the, the May FOMC meeting should sound more hawkish on the margin than Chair Powell's press conference. So potentially we get a little bit more insight into what they were thinking. I am always wondering just how Davis Chairman Powell is on that FOMC and how much distance there might be between him and everyone else on the committee. And maybe that starts to sort of dance a little bit on the FOMC minute stage a little bit later this week. To your point, every single time there is a Fed meeting, everyone says this is Powell's chance to push back against the market, to tighten financial conditions, to get inflation under control. And every time he just can't help but do a dove. Like he cannot help but be a little bit more on the dovish side. And that to me speaks to your point. Is he more on the extreme dovish side where he really wants to nail the soft landing and, and solidify his legacy as really achieving what a lot of people thought was impossible? He's got one gear and he's stuck in it and he was stuck in it in the last news conference Maybe. as well. Maybe. Maybe he has another gear. Oh, other gears. Yeah. Okay. I'd, I'd like to see them. Let's see if he, if he has any. Let's turn to this story. Gold and copper surging to all-time highs. Copper topping 11,000 a ton, extending a months-long rally driven by expected supply shortages and gold hitting a record high, boosted by increasing optimism. The Federal Reserve will start easing monetary policy this year. Joining us to discuss is Kona Hack of EDNF Man. Joining us out of London. Kona, let's talk about copper first and then we can talk about the broader commodity complex. What is happening with copper? How much of this is just speculative frenzy? And how much of it is real, friends, real fundamentals driven by a lot of demand and not much supply? Um, so copper has been a darling for a while. I mean, a lot of research houses, banks, hedge funds, mining companies, you name it, they've all been talking up the fundamental bullishes, the bullish fundamental stories of copper. And then that's slowly been gaining interest and you've started to see a lot of speculative money coming in. And today, short term, you're seeing a huge influx of investor money coming in. The longer term, fun longer term fundamentals are still there, still yet to be borne out, to be honest. But I think the momentum is definitely building out. And now you've got the momentum and the systematic traders that are coming in. So I think it's become a bit of a frenzy right now. So, so basically, if I understand what the answer was, Kona, basically right now the momentum has further to go, but fundamentally things haven't changed. And even though things are good, they might not be as good as some of the speculation is driving it. Am I characterizing that correctly? Yeah, I think, you know, the story about mining issues, the fact that the supply is not nearly as enough as, as, it, as it should be happening, considering how big the ESG demand for transition metals is expected to be, that's all going to happen in the future. Today, the story is, is still China, where demand is lackluster. There's a lot of demand for the new economy, sort of the transition metals. That sort of thing is definitely boosting. But I think in terms of construction and real estate, that demand is still very lackluster. Premiums um, in, in China are still very weak. Inventories are low at the LME list ex, um, exchanges, that's true. But I think short term, we, it's more about the investor frenzy in, in anticipation of the longer term fundamentals. Our own columnist, Javier Blas, would agree with you. And he put out a great column about this uh, <laughs> that I recommend everybody read. I'm wondering, Kona, if there's a similarity, if there's a, there's a rhyming between what's going on in copper and what's going on with gold, heading yet another record and really continuing to climb. Is it the same kind of tenor in terms of what's driving people to both of these metals? Or is it different? Is there something more sustainable in one versus the other? So gold is definitely a bet on the fact that the Fed is probably likely to cut interest rates at some point this year. Um, that's obviously weakening the US dollar and I think that just lifts all commodities generally speaking. So that's the two things I'd say is in common to both co copper and gold. Um, but gold today is benefiting from safe haven demand given the fact of um, Iranian president dying and um, the ongoing political, geopolitical tensions around the world. So I think that's definitely boosting gold. 
Um, I think going forward, where the two go, I think gold potentially has higher to go, particularly if you are a dollar bear, and you, you would be a dollar bear if you think that interest rates are going to keep on weakening. I, my, I personally do not necessarily think the Fed needs to cut interest rates. I think the US economy is running pretty hot. So um, I think they can just hold, to be honest. And I think if we start getting data coming out of the US economy suggesting that it's still very hot and therefore the Fed may have to delay it in any rate cuts, I think that could then weak, weaken um, the gold rally to, to a certain extent. But I think going forward, I think geopolitical tensions are here to stay for a while. I think that could be supportive. Um, and I think copper has the whole environmental story and the supply side mining um, slowness there in response. I think that's also potentially um, uh, supporting copper. How much do you think gold's rally has been down to U.S. sanctions policy? Could you repeat that? How much do you put credence on that what some are saying there's a rally in gold due to U.S. sanctions policy and the concern about not being able to trade in the U.S. dollar? Oh, that's a tricky one. Um, I mean, yeah, I think ultimately sanctions, policy, geopolitics, they all have an impact on, on safe haven demand. I think gold is always going to be a, a good bet as a hedge against any of these uncertainties. So I think to a certain extent that definitely does have an impact. Um, but I think today it's really still a very much a US dollar bet, the fact that in the short term the dollar is expected to weaken. Um, and I think central bank buying is, uh, is definitely going to support the, uh, the gold prices. And, um, you know, it's just fundamentally, it's more of a currency compared to other typical commodities. And I think supply demand fundamentals are not something you can really an use to analyze gold. So it really is your view on, on the um, geopolitical situation right now. Kind of appreciate your time today. Some big moves in the commodity market. Just getting some breaking news. An update to guidance coming from JP Morgan ahead of their annual investor day. Here are the new numbers. Full year net interest income. This is the outlook. About 91 billion US dollars. They had seen previously about 90 US billion dollars. Let's just go through the pre-market price action for you and look at what's happening with the stock in the pre-market. We are just about positive here, Lisa, by 0.6 percent. They also talk about a billion dollar increase in their total cost, but that's because of a donation that they made to the J.P. Morgan Chase Foundation at a time where they are uh, significantly <laughs> increasing some of their revenues. There's also this line that tailwinds from 2023 are likely turning into headwinds, and I do wonder how much that has to do with uh, some of the extra interest they have to pay depositors to keep some of their money. Because if you've noticed, we've gotten a lot of messages from our respective banks saying, by the way, I can offer you this savings rate. I can offer you this CD. I have never gotten so many of these before. And the pace at which I've been getting them has been really significant. So how much does that become a bite into how much they can kind of capitalize on higher rates without Or they do away? that thing that really annoys me where they set a target for how much you need to have in your account and then you get a bonus. Oh, yeah. So not an interest rate over a period of time, just sort of like a cash bonus for keeping it there. You mean if you have, you know, a <laughs> certain incredible amount that's way over the FD I see limit. You're not going to save get. it precisely. Yeah, yeah. That you basically know. you can get extra $2,000. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Awesome. Just Here. great. Appreciate and that. And a pen. So latest on the banks, the pen too. Tom would always talk about a toaster. Well, that was a thing. No toaster. In the 1980s. We're going way back. Yeah, yeah. No I got toasters. stickers too when I opened my first account <laughs> at age 11. Good stuff. I'm sure you'd prefer 5%. <laughs> At that point, probably yeah. stickers were just fine. Okay. Let's get you an update on stories elsewhere this morning. Carisha Bloomberg Brief with Danny Berger. Hey, Danny. Hey, John. One of Wall Street's most prominent bears has just capitulated. Morgan Stanley's Mike Wilson now sees the S&P 500 up 2% by June of next year, boosting his target to 5,400 from 4,500, which would have been a 15% tumble. Wilson and the Morgan Stanley team say that they expect a sunny macro environment, but Wilson did reiterate his view that outcomes are becoming harder to to predict with volatile data. He had said last month that he was steering clear of big calls given that economic uncertainty. You can hear more. Mike Wilson is going to be joining the surveillance team at 8 a.m. Eastern tomorrow. Now, the ship that destroyed Baltimore's Francis Scott Key Bridge is set to be moved to nearby docks today. 18 hours of preparations to move the Dolly container ship began yesterday. Officials are going to be using several tugboats in a so-called refloating operation. It's expected to take 21 hours to do. Transit begins at high tide. The Dolly had crashed into the bridge after leaving the port of Baltimore in the early hours of March 26. 
Manchester City were crowned champions of the English Football's Premier League for a record fourth consecutive year. It was a 3-1 win over West Ham on the final day of the season, and that sealed their title win. It's a 17th trophy for manager Pep Guardiola at Man City, and that could become 18 next weekend when they meet crosstown rival Man U in the final FA Cup final. And that is your Bloomberg Brief, John. Danny, thank you. I think I'll say it through gritted teeth. Congratulations, Man City again. Oh, that was so... And clip, clip this for next year. <laughs> yeah. The year after. Exactly. That's the, the year point. After. Doesn't it get boring after a while? Someone tweeted over the weekend, what US franchise would you compare this to? Like the Warriors, Brady and the Patriots or Lance Armstrong? The New York Mets. And the Tour de France. The Mets. Come on. <laughs> Just, I don't know, or the Jets. Can they all miss that Lance Armstrong reference? I got there, that. But, I right, got that. Good. They're doping okay. or they're like, you know, I got it. Well done, Bramah. Anytime. I'm next on the program, Rethinking 2%. We all talk about wanting to go back to 2%. Every single quote you had this morning yep. assumes that 2% is the right inflation talk. 2% is totally arbitrary. That's next on the program, live from New York City. This is Bloomberg. Sports chat didn't stop in the commercial break, and let me tell you, it was just as dreadful in the commercial break as it was when we hey, were live. It was a dreadful. Ago. It was pretty bad. <laughs> Equity futures on the S&P positive by 0.1%. Yields unchanged on a 10-year 441.79. Under Savannah's this morning, rethinking 2%. We all talk about wanting to go back to 2%. Every single quote you had this morning yep. assumes that 2% is the right inflation target. 2% is totally arbitrary. We should all realize that if we are pursuing the wrong inflation target, the risk of a mistake, and that mistake would mean sacrificing growth unnecessarily, the risk of that mistake is high, especially when the low-income people are most at risk. Here's the latest this morning. Plenty of Fed speak on deck today, including Barb Waller-Jefferson and Atlanta Fed President Raphael Bostic sitting down with Bloomberg's Mike McKee in less than an hour. Abigail Watt of UBS writing, quote, we expect the general message remains of needing to wait longer than previously assumed before beginning to dial back restrictiveness. Abigail joins us now for more. Abigail, we're light on data this week, heavy on Fed speak. What would you be looking for from Fed officials as they communicate to the general public? Yeah, first off, thank you for having me join today. Um, I think the the main thing this week is thinking about those speeches where the Fed speakers are going to be talking on the economic outlook, um, and in particular, those speakers um, that, you know, uh, I, are in the Board of Governors. So first off, as you said, we've got um, Vice Chair uh, Jefferson speaking today, and he'll be speaking on the economic outlook and on house prices. Um, and then we'll have Governor Waller speaking on the economic outlook on Tuesday. Um, and I think the the way that um, FOMC members are digesting perhaps some of the better news that they saw in the April inflation data last week, um, and how they're balancing that versus, I guess, some of the disappointment that they've obviously referenced um, through Q1's inflation data. Um, I think also of note will be um, Governor Waller's um, speech on Friday, um, in which he's going to be talking about our star. Uh, we've written recently about this idea that the Fed is perhaps operating as if short run our star has, has increased. Um, and uh, Governor Waller has in the past uh, sounded a little bit skeptical on this. So I think we'll be looking out to see um, the comments from, from Waller on our star on Friday as well. Abigail, let's talk about the data you're focused on too. Kit Jukes of SockGen calling it second division data this week in America. How much weight do you think we should put on? How much attention does something like UMIT consumer confidence numbers, inflation, all of that, how much weight confidence or rather how much focus does that deserve? Yeah, so I think, I mean, I think there's a couple of um, data releases that I would watch that are maybe maybe not as in focus because they're, they're slightly more lagged. So, for example, we'll be getting the, the data for Q4 from the QCEW, and I think um, we've been seeing kind of uh, a different strength in terms of the employment growth in the QCEW versus non-farm payrolls, uh, with that running a little bit slower. And so I think that's one thing that we'll be looking out for this week. There's also um, the quarterly services survey. These Obviously, these are quarterly surveys, um, but the quarterly services survey will impact into um, the, the kind of services spending estimates in the Q1 
GDP revisions next week. And I think in light of some of the weakness that we saw in last week's retail sales data, I do think it's worth watching to see kind of whether there's um, any kind of revisions coming through the pipeline on the services side of, of spending as well. Um, and then, as you say, uh, University of Michigan, uh, we'll get the final release for the University of Michigan survey later this week. Um, and I think one of the things that, you know, people were watching in the preliminary release was the inflation expectations series. And we did see them tick a little bit higher. So um, I think one thing we'll be watching is as we see that kind of full sample um, of receipts kind of pulling into that data um, is whether we see any revisions on the inflation expectations side. Um, so, yeah, I think those are the key things that I would be watching on the data side this week. There's another key thing that I'm watching, and that's the price of copper and the price of gold. And I wonder how much that really speaks to some sort of resurgence in the manufacturing sector. You've been talking about the weakness we've been seeing in manufacturing. How do you pair that with runaway prices in copper and even in gold? Yeah, so I think it's um, I think it's a good it's a good point around the kind of strength of the manufacturing sector. I mean, if we look at the the hard economic data, the industrial production data last week um, were, were fairly weak. Um, and you know, again, looking at what's coming this week, we'll get the S and P uh, global manufacturing PMI. Our expectations is that we see that tick back down into contraction at 49. You know, we have generally seen both the kind of softer maybe survey measures and also the the kind of um, harder industrial production data kind of coming in weaker in general in the manufacturing sector. So from, from an economic perspective, that's what we've seen in terms of the, the kind of hard hard data um, on the manufacturing sector. And we, we kind of continue to see um, see weakness in that in, in the surveys that we'll get on the manufacturing sector this week. Abigail, we kicked off the show with Steve Chiverone saying everything's just fine. Data, fine. Economic activity, fine. Earnings, fine. You say you're fine when you don't want to get into all of the details and there's a time of flux. It's not a very exciting kind of comment. Does that work for you, that things are just fine? And if that's the case, how long can things just be fine? Yeah, so I mean, our expectation is that we do kind of see growth slow through this year. Um, and I think I think it's when you're coming off some of the re resilience and the strength that you saw, you know, 3.1% annual growth last year was a really strong growth outturn in the US. And so I think some of that kind of moderation um, in the pace of growth is probably kind of what, what you're getting there. It's just more of a, a kind of a slowing in, in kind of the, the economic um, outlook that, that's coming through there. And I think you're coming off kind of very, very obviously very strong growth print. So I think maybe that's what you're seeing there. It's just more of a moderation back down um, in, in towards more kind of a normal paces of growth rather than some of the boomy prints that we saw um, through last year. And it's the same on the labor market, right? We're seeing a slowing in the labor market. Um, and I think it's more just a, a kind of a, a slowing in some of the momentum that we saw um, given you know, the, the strength that you're coming from. Abigail, on the heels of a lot of consumer sentiment showing that consumers are concerned, what do you make of the state of the U.S. consumer? Yeah, so one of the ways that we've been looking at this actually is looking to see kind of both the upper end of the income distribution and the lower end of the income distribution. And what we're seeing is, you know, you're seeing the balance sheets of those at the upper end of the income distribution holding up fairly well despite the Fed's hiking cycle. But you are seeing instead at the lower end of the income spectrum, you're starting to see some signs of stress. Obviously, recently we got the, the New York Fed's consumer debt and credit panel. And in that, we saw delinquencies beginning to kind of continue to rise and surpassing um, rates seen at the end of 2019 for both credit cards and auto loans. Um, but when we look at the distribution of, uh, of who contributes the most to spending in the US economy, it's the upper end of the income distribution. And when we look at who contributes the most to the growth in consumer spending, it's the upper end. So one of the reasons why we've kind of actually, we're, we're still expecting the consumer to slow this year. We're still expecting consumption growth to slow, but we've had to mark up our expectations on the back of, I guess, some of that resilience in the upper end of the income spectrum. Getting a but read on this is really, stuff. really difficult, Abigail. Do you think there's contradictions between what the companies are telling us and what we're seeing in the data? Yeah, it is. It is very difficult to get a clear read, and I think I do think it's important to focus in on on some of that di the distributional effects. I think that is something that you can miss if you look at the headline. And I think actually, if you look, so a, a really good example of that is if you look at overall delinquencies, they're sitting kind of well below where they were in 2019. But that's kind of actually very much suppressed by student loan 
repayments and the delinquency rate is on student loans um, and to a degree mortgages. Um, so it, it masks, I guess, some of the stress that you might actually be seeing in, in the consumer sector. Abigail, appreciate your time this morning. Thank you. Abigail Watt there of UBS. Attempted to break it down of what's happening with the consumer. We said last week there's three ways. It's more than that, but here's three. Ask a bank, ask a company, look at the data. And there seems to be contradictions at the moment between the three. Depending on the company, depending on the data point, and depending on what you hear from certain Fed officials, this is the reason why it's been complicated. And Mike Wilson, to his credit, has been saying it has been very difficult to get the macro environment as he shifts to a more bullish stance. An upgrade from Mike Wilson making some headlines over at Morgan Stanley this morning. Coming up next, we'll catch up with Stuart Kaiser of City, Ali Base of the Crisis Group, Atlanta Fed President Raphael Bostic, and we'll speak to Amanda Lynham of BlackRock. Your equity market this Monday morning, positive by 0.1%. Thank you. It's the lower end of the income distribution that's really having a hard time. If the labor market cracks, then these delinquency issues could make this group more sensitive to a potential downturn. Even though we are worried about U.S. fiscal, the markets will be willing to extend that confidence in U.S. productivity. Seeing a, a, a severe growth slowdown, I think, is something that um, is, is further down the horizon as potential risk. If anything happens to the labor market, which I hope it doesn't, we are going to slow down really quickly. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Perro, Lisa Abramowitz and Anne-Marie Hordern. The second hour of Bloomberg surveillance begins right now, live from New York City. Good morning, good morning. Your equity market on the S&P 500, positive by 0.1%. Let's get you set up for the week ahead, looking ahead to Wednesday. NVIDIA after the clock is the main event for earnings, and then it's the Fed speak. Here's the next 24 hours. Bostick, Mester, Barr, Waller, Jefferson, 7.30 Eastern time. Mike McKee. Elisa sitting down with the Atlanta Fed president. So how are they going to interpret the weakness that we've seen? Is this really the return of the disinflation that we've all been hoping for? Or are they being more tepid about it? They're basically saying the way that we're hearing from a number of different analysts, we need a couple more months. More interesting is going to be Friday. Uh, really, Chris Waller, he's going to be talking about r -Start. And I know people are thinking, r -Start, really? I'm going to care about that. This idea of actually embracing longer-term inflation expectations, do they shift? The market's shifted, do they? Everything's fine. Could it be better? than right now. You liked that, didn't you? Steve Chevron, previous hour, everything's fine. If you say to somebody, how are you doing? And I'm they right. say, I'm fine. Does that leave you satisfied? Doing okay. Do you feel good? Do you feel like you understand how they're doing in any way, shape, or form? I'm fine. Maybe they just don't want to talk about their feelings. Exactly. They don't want to talk about their feelings, but they have feelings underneath. They just are not identifiable. Is that necessarily well, a bad thing? Well, it's just, it just leaves- a therapy session? It leaves you What's wanting wrong with you, for more. There's not a lot of <laughs> conviction in fine. Thank and you. I, th I think the Morgan Stanley note this morning puts puts it right there in the forefront. Since the beginning of 2023, the consensus view in the macro backdrop has bounced between hard landing, soft landing, and no landing outcomes, which leaves you kind of with, we're fine. When things are fine, it means there's no news. And when there's no news right now, that's good news because all the news over the last three months, four months, has been about upside inflation surprises, which is why inline is the new beat you know in what? financial markets. May fine is good right now, which I think is what Steve was trying to, trying to communicate. So right now, fine is good. But when you have people who are paid to trade every single day, fine is not good enough. Fine is sort of this anxiety producing, what am I missing? What's going to come and bite me? Because right now we're looking at a situation that could potentially turn. You could have a labor market weakening. You could have the wrong kind of disinflation with weakness that then undermines fine. There's always something to worry about. That's true. Sometimes you should worry about upside risk to markets as well, not just downside risk, Bramo. This is what Morgan Stanley's got to say this morning, following an upgrade in <laughs> well both Europe and in the US as well. A sunny macro environment, a clearer path of disinflation, growth and policy over the next few months sets us up for a constructive outlook across markets. How much of this really depends, though, on fiscal spending? How much of this has to do with industrial spending? Because at this point, I do wonder if we're really OK if you get the same kind of creep higher in the initial jobless claims. I understand things are looking pretty good. But why is it when you talk to people, they don't feel good? We still have to go back to that. Why is it that you're still seeing certain cracks in certain segments of the population? I don't know. I mean, fine is a mystery to me. Well, it's because part of it is it's really hard to explain to the American consumer that, yes, the rate of inflation is coming down, but the prices are never going back to what you remember. But speaking of upgrades, Jonathan, I know you brought up Binky Chatter earlier today. 5,500 because he says they see the earnings cycle having plenty of legs. And we'll see that this week with NVIDIA. He thinks things are fine as well. The one thing that got Steve nervous, it was interesting, the one thing that got Steve see? nervous is that a lot of people agree with him. 
That was the one thing that got him nervous. Yeah, well, and he said, I said, what are you doing with fine? I mean, you just basically sit there and take times off and go hang out with your kids, which is lovely, and I think it's wonderful. But I just wonder if, you know, he said, I actually am actually getting nervous and questioning my theory because it doesn't feel like this is something sticky. After NVIDIA, two weeks of summer, Stuart Kaiser said he's going to join us in a moment. That's what he's going to talk about. The scores right now on the S&P 500, equity futures positive by 0.1%. Stu's just around a corner. Look out for that following four weeks of gains in the equity market. Ed Mills of Raymond James will be joining us as well. Looking forward to catching up with Ed on the latest in the Middle East and Atlanta Fed President Raphael Bostic on the Fed's path forward. We begin with our top story, kicking off the week with all eyes on NVIDIA. City Stuart Kaiser writing this, markets will be captivated by NVIDIA earnings, but after that event, there are about two weeks without clear catalysts. Last quarter, Russell 2000 and S&P 500 equal weight both outperformed the S&P by about 200 basis points between NVIDIA earnings and the March CPI report. We like positioning for a similar pattern. Stu joins us for more. Good morning, Stu. Good morning. How are it's you? It's fine. Good. Is two weeks of no data a good thing? Uh, it, it's, I, honestly, it's going to be a really big test because last week when you had kind of no data, the market was able to, or two weeks ago, when you had no data, the market just sort of trended higher. You had a nice clean week. I think this time you have a two-week window. It's right around month end. You know, the question I think is with the market at an all time high, do people kind of trim some risk and do you get a little chop or is it everything's fine and dandy? Actually, if you add dandy, it makes it much more enjoyable. It does. Uh, <laughs> if it's fine and dandy, I think you can kind of, kind of drift higher. So our view is strong earnings season, the same way you had a strong earnings season last time. That tends to favor large cap because they're generating the, the bulk of the earnings. Once you get out of that kind of earnings event, we do think you can get a little, little episode of broadening into that big June 12th day. With the emphasis on a little episode yes. and not maybe a durable broadening, <laughs> why is that? Uh, you know, I, th I think there's still, as you, all, as you all have highlighted, there's still some anxiety, you know, kind of in the system. I think a lot of it, to me, um, revolves around the labor market. I think that's, that's the area that is by, by far the biggest risk to equity markets. And if you look at the KC Fed labor tracker or other, other metrics, there are some, some sort of cracks or, or little weeds kind of in the garden that you need to deal with. And I think that's going to kind of keep people a little bit conservative. And you pointed to the idea that momentum has not recovered alongside the broader market. I was talking about that. We were talking about that earlier. I thought that was a really interesting point, that this isn't necessarily the GameStop frenzy that's going to fuel the everything up kind of moment, and yet you're still constructive. What do you take from that, the idea that momentum is not really driving this. Uh, it might be a little bit of kind of buy the rumor, sell the fact type issue. You know, like uh, you had very strong earnings from TMT companies. I think that that's really what stabilized the market that week of kind of April 26 or so, right? And I think now that you've gotten through that period, you know, people are probably taking a little bit of profits and maybe taking a little bit of risk off the table. I mean, we're back at all time highs again. We were below 5,000 pre TMT earnings. We're at 5,300 now, so I do think you're just seeing some people kind of adjusting positioning, and maybe it's sell in May and go to the lake type situation, you know? So is that what you're recommending? Do you feel fine? <laughs> I feel pretty good, actually. Okay, uh, that's different than fine. I just <laughs> want to say that. One thing that you pointed to was uh, initial jobless claims, and I thought that was interesting because I remember when people used to care about those, so then they started to flatline, and then everybody ignored them. Is that going to be first-tier data this week? Yeah, I mean, claims are important. If you think back to last summer, last June we printed 105 in non-farm payrolls. You got claims, you know, kind of above 250. If we got a repeat of that, obviously the market's not going to light that combination of data. So, claims matter. It's just tough when you're at such a, you know, such a low level. You would need a significant step up in claims, I think, to get people's. You know, people's attention kind of ticking up 10K here or there is not going to do it. You know, you're going to need, a, I think, a significant step higher of claims to be disruptive. Stuart, how do you read the inflation data? Because we saw the bumps early in the year. It was just that. This is bumps, not a trend. Then we get one print that's basically in line and everyone's all excited saying, OK, we're back to the disinflationary trend off of one report. Is that fair? Uh, I mean, it's, it's a good question. The, the reason people are taking it so well is I think they interpret the Fed as taking it very well, <laughs> right? This is a Fed that has sort of a cutting bias to it. And I think the market is saying if you're printing 30 basis points of, of core CPI, that gives the Fed kind of leeway to cut later this year. If you keep print, printing 30 basis points a core, you're almost back to 4% by the end of the year. So, you know, 30 basis points is probably not going to do it medium term. But right now, I think it, it gives people confidence that the Fed is kind of willing to cut in that environment. You know, we said at the beginning of the year, you're sort of uber bull case for markets is you soft land or you don't go into a recession and the Fed does a couple insurance cuts behind that because that gives you a strong EPS outlook and potentially you get a little bit of juice on the valuation side. So that was kind of what could get you up to those 5,500 type levels. Um, that's what the market wants. Ultimately, it's what we all want. So, you know, when you get data that allows you to confirm that a little bit, I think the market tries to run with it. You've said for a while that when the labor market starts to weaken, you're going to get nervous. Mm -hmm. Your team is predicting that. 
on the economic side of the research division. Yep. What does that mean for your call? Does it just become increasingly short term and much more tactical? Is it much more difficult to have a longer term view of where this equity market is going to be? 100 percent. I mean, it's, we, we, we'd recommended hedging a little bit, you know, the last month just to kind of manage that risk. The risk reward of the market is not what it was two months ago, in our view. You've had, you know, U.S. economic surprise has, has gotten quite negative. You've got some some hiccups going on in the labor market. Earnings are strong, but it's starting to get priced in. So, yeah, we're we're keeping it much, much more tactical. When you get volatility down to these levels, I think it makes a whole lot of sense either to hedge or to, or to use options for your upside. I mean, you're paying sub 10 implied volatility for upside on the S&P. That feels like a, a very responsible way to have your kind of long exposure on. So yeah, we're, we're much more tactical, much more careful. And I think the market is showing you that. It's, it's going to be responsive to bad news. Um, unfortunately, or fortunately, we just haven't had that bad news. How high is the bar for Wednesday for NVIDIA? Got another call right now in front of me, this time from Steve Full on NVIDIA. Price target raised to 1085 from 910. The quote, beat and raise widely anticipated. Same thing came from Barclays early this morning. All signs still point to another revision higher. How high is that bar Wednesday afternoon? I think it's a pretty high bar, man. The market's gotten used to them basically beating by two billion, <laughs> you know, every quarter for a number of quarters in a row. Two billion used to be a big number. So I think I think it's the, the bar is pretty high, you know, for Nvidia here. Um, perhaps a little less high than it was a couple weeks ago when you know the market was sub five thousand and there was a little bit of stress in the system. But the the issue with Nvidia is it's it's been a huge part of revenue and earnings growth. It's also a huge part of market cap, which is why if you take the Nvidia implied move and, you know, kind of multiply it by its market cap, it could move the S&P 40 to 50 basis points that day by itself. So, you know, the, the bar is definitely high. The way we track sort of sentiment, it's not quite as aggressively high as it was last quarter. Um, last quarter, you had ne inverted skew, which means your calls cost more than your puts. That's highly unusual at the single stock level. Some of that has started to come out of the system. So bullish, definitely bar is high, but it does feel maybe, I think people are starting to just except the fact that you can't continually beat by $2 billion every quarter, right? So I think people have kind of prepared themselves for a little bit. It'll be fine, I think. <laughs> you think it's going to be fine? You feel fine? I think it'll all be fine, yeah. Fine and dandy, which is actually yeah. better than that. I will just say, uh, one thing that I find interesting is that we used to have companies that were bellwether companies, whether it was the banks, which no longer serve as that, whether it was Walmart, which maybe no longer serves as that either. It's sort of a Walmart story, not necessarily a macro story. Is NVIDIA serving more as a macro story in terms of AI adoption? Will we get a sort of broader read through to the to the market and sort of the sentiment behind it from Nvidia than just an Nvidia story. I, I think definitely so. I think NVIDIA um, it has become a macro story. You see how aggressively it's even priced into the S&P 500. These events are like our, our market-based events. You know, I think we've talked in the past, there's a view that AI, you know, increases productivity and can potentially lift GDP growth on a go-forward basis. It has massive impacts on the labor market. So, you know, AI at large is a macro story. NVIDIA is right now the cleanest, most direct way to trade that. So it's made that, you know, a macro story. Um, uh, Eli Lilly and those with the GLP-1s, I think, would fall into that category as well. Those are probably the two sort of single stocks or themes that have become macro over the years. Amory said it, data point of the week, right? Data Nvidia. point of the week. Yeah, Goldman Sachs last week said $1,100 per share that they uplifted for NVIDIA. This is the data point, I think, whether or not the markets will be fine or maybe less than fine. Wednesday after the close. You got a word on Man City? Uh, a couple of words. No, sad. sad. Are sad. they the Mets? Not uh, fine. <laughs> no, they're not the Mets. <laughs> Unfortunately, they're not the Mets. Uh, <laughs> I root for the Mets of the EPL, which is the unfortunate the Unfortunate situation. I hear you. Stu, it's good to see you. Good it's to see fine. You. It's going to be all right. Stuart Kaiser of City. Thank you, sir. Let's give you an update on stories elsewhere this morning. Here is your Bloomberg Brief with Danny Berger. Hey, Danny. Hey, John. Japan's benchmark bond yield has hit a decade high. Ten-year JGB yields are up by about two and a half bips today to 0.75%, a level last seen in 2013. Houses from Vanguard to PIMCO expect three or more hikes this year, eventually sending yields to 1% or more. MUFG's Derek Halpany told me earlier this morning that the market was still underpricing the start of Japan's hiking cycle. We're expecting 15 basis points in July. Possibly we get up to uh, a range of 40 to 50 basis points around the turn of the year. But I think certainly a more hawkish BOJ, and I think the markets are underpriced for what's coming. That was on the Bloomberg Brief, which is every weekday morning at 5 a.m. Eastern. J.P. Morgan has lifted its full-year net income to $91 billion versus the $90 billion that it predicted in the first quarter earnings release last month. The firm also raised its expense guidance for the year to $92 billion, but that's largely due to a $1 billion donation the bank made to its J.P. Morgan Chase Foundation. The new guidance comes ahead of its annual investor day in New York.
and shares of Ryanair falling this morning in the Dublin trade down one and a quarter percent. The airline announced ticket prices in the summer may be flat to modestly higher, but the carrier also says that strong demand is there despite constrained capacity. Bloomberg spoke to the Ryanair CFL, CFO Neil Sorahan earlier today. We're, we're taking in over 600,000 uh, bookings a night, so demand is huge. Uh, and my advice would be to yourself, Tom, and everybody else, mm -hmm. book sooner rather than later, because I think fares are only going to go in one, one direction. Stick around for our interview with the Ryanair CEO, Michael O'Leary. That's in about an hour's time at 8.15 Eastern. And that's your Bloomberg Brief. John. A big conversation coming up about pricing a little bit later through the summer. Danny, thanks for that. More from Danny in about 30 minutes' time. Up next on the program, Iran's president killed in a helicopter crash. Geopolitical risk is elevated uh, still further by these deaths. It's going to make Iran uh, essentially double down on its own stance, I think, uh, for the next couple of months. The latest out of the region coming up next, live from New York City this morning. Good morning. Live from New York City, welcome back to the program. Monday morning. Here's the price action. Equity futures on the S&P 500 shaping up as follows. Positive by 0.1%. On the Nasdaq, positive by 0.2%. On a Russell, up by 0.2% as well. Lisa, that's four weeks of gains for the equity market. And guess what happened to the Dow? We didn't even talk about the Dow. We never do. North of 40,000 for the first time, crossing that mark. I saw that and I thought to myself, wow. You know, if someone were here, we'd be talking about that for like literally the entire day. So I thought I'd mention that. But yeah, the question is, can it continue and how much is this really hinging on the idea that the Fed can do some insurance cuts? I can see TK at the core of my eye in the other <laughs> studio. He's already messaged me this morning. So if you want to get some Dow chat and you get in the car, maybe you're at home right now, Bloomberg Radio for a lot more on that. Wall to wall. Let's switch to the board from the equity market and turn to bonds and talk about what's happening in fixed income. Yields just about unchanged at 441.59. We've had three weeks on a 10-year of declining yields, Fed speak, economic data, it's all Lisa pushing in that direction over the last month or so. What did you say, one speed for Fed Chair Jay Powell? One gear, dovish, yeah. and it has been that way for a while. Which is the reason why if you get some downside surprises to the economic data, it's been viewed as a good thing because it gives them a pass to finally do what they want to do, which is cut rates. Question is, and you raised this before, John, how much do you see the weakening in the data being bad news is bad news in the sense that you are seeing some sort of real slowdown that is negative for a lot of the more rosier projections. That's the bond setup. Let's turn to foreign exchange and give you a sneak peek of what's happening with the euro. And then I'll finish on commodities for you. The euro at the moment about 108.66. But to Lisa's point, all of that stuff coming together, pulling down yields, push that into the FX market, weaker dollar and a slightly stronger euro. And we might have more upside ahead, at least in the short term, according to the likes of Kit Jukes and Sokgen, given the second division economic data you get this week, which is unlikely to move the dial on the US side of things, maybe giving Europe some space to outperform again, look ahead for the PMIs at the back end of this week. I mentioned commodities. I do just want to finish on gold and copper. All-time highs on both gold and copper. And just to sit on copper, what did Jeff Curry, formerly of Goldman and now of Carlisle, say recently that this might be one of the trades of his career over the last 30 years? He called it one of the best long trades Ever. He said that to Lisa and myself, and then he also joined um, Tracy Alloway and, uh, and Joe Weisenthal on their podcast. He is so bullish on copper. And this has to do so much of the industrial play and not just the manufacturing boost, but also the fact that this is the commodity to have for electrifying the grid and the green energy future. Copper right now up by 2.6%. A word on gold positive by 0.9%. We've seen a series of all-time highs throughout 2024 so far in the commodity market. Under surveillance this morning, Iran's president killed in a helicopter crash. Of course, geopolitical risk is elevated uh, still further by these deaths, but that... Uh the impact could be quite limited. It's going to make Iran uh, essentially double down on its own stance, I think, uh, for the next couple of months anyway. That 50-day uh, bogey in terms of a, a, of a new election is very is very important. Uh, and they're going to go out of their way to uh, show that it's, it's basically business as usual. 
Here's the latest. Iran's supreme leader announcing five days of mourning following the death of the country's president and foreign minister. They were killed when their helicopter crashed returning from an event on the Azerbaijan border. The Ayatollah saying an election for Iran's next president will take place in the next 50 days. Ali Ves of the Crisis Group joins us now. Ali, can you describe for us the next 50 days in that country, what it's going to look like? So as of today, Vice President Mokhber has taken over the responsibilities of uh, President Raisi uh, and is going to, in collaboration with the head of the parliament and the uh, head of the judiciary, organize the election. Uh, now, the, what that means is that candidates would have to announce their running for the race uh, in the next few days. And then there is a very complex vetting process in Iran. Uh, that is likely to disqualify anyone who is even considered a loyal critic of the system and would only agree to uh, the most loyal insiders to be able to run for the presidency. And then they would have to organize the election, uh, which is a pretty tough challenge for the regime because they had an election, a parliamentary runoff just last week, in which only 8% of the population in the capital city, Tehran, actually showed up at the polls. Uh, and finally, they have to put together a new cabinet and uh, get confirmation for the new minister. So it's quite a process ahead of them. Ali, with Raisi's death, does this mean that Khomeini's son is likely going to be the next supreme leader? You know, that's there's a lot of speculation around it, but I actually think it's very unlikely because this is a regime that has lost tremendous amount of legitimacy in the past few years. Uh, and if it becomes a hereditary system for a revolutionary system that came to power and toppled the monarchy 45 years ago, uh, I think it will be uh, kind of putting, uh, shooting themselves in the foot. Uh, and, and I think that's very unlikely. But what Mojtaba would like to do is to be able to continue running the show from behind the scenes. And that's why uh, I think President Raisi was an attractive candidate to a groom for the top job because he was so subservient that the current office of the Supreme Leader would have been able to preserve uh, its influence even after Ayatollah Khamenei passes. Given the power lies in the Supreme Leader, what is going to change between today and, say, 50 days out? Look, not much, because the president has very little sway when it gets to foreign policy uh, or even uh, actually internal uh, policy as well, as well. And especially in the case of President Raisi, who uh, really disempowered the executive branch even more than uh, all of his uh, predecessors combined. Um, and in that sense, I expect more continuity than change. But one thing is clear, that in the next 50 days, Iran is going to be internally focused. The question is whether that would provide its adversaries in the region with an opportunity to push back against it. And if that happens, a regime that already feels it is on its back foot and in a position of weakness is likely to lash out. And given what we saw between Iran and Israel uh, last month, I think there are significant risks there. What does a lash out look like at this point? Well, we saw what it looked like last uh, last month, right, with 350 drones and missiles being fired directly from the Iranian territory uh, towards Israel. Now, thankfully, 99 percent of them were shut down. But this was because this was a highly telegraphed uh, and made for TV attack. Uh, if it's a surprise attack and at a larger scale, uh, it will be much more difficult uh, to uh, get away with it without uh, significant death or destruction. Uh, and of course, this is just talking about what Iran could do. There are tensions between Israel and Hezbollah. Uh, there are unilateral actions that uh, the Houthis in Yemen could take in targeting shipping uh, in the Red Sea that might be completely uncoordinated with the Iranians. Uh, and so the risks in the region remain particularly high. Uh, the only thing that has been added to it is uh, this degree of uncertainty that didn't exi exist at the top of the Iranian political system, but now it does. Ali, when it comes to the likes of Rouhani, he recently wrote an open letter that got a lot of criticism from the hard right members of the regime. He's seen sometimes as, as the centrist reformist. What happened to those individuals? They've been completely sidelined, Anne-Marie, uh, because uh, the system it, it primarily cares about ideological confirmation at the top rather than uh, legitimacy from the bottom. And because uh, the, the entire focus of the Islamic Republic right now is on the question of succession. Uh, and they want to take no risk. So they want only people who are completely loyal 
to the Supreme Leader's vision for the future of the country uh, to be in charge. And that's why reformists, pragmatists, centrists, including uh, former President Rouhani, have been completely marginalized. And I expect the upcoming presidential election in Iran to be very similar to U.S. primary elections, in which basically uh, you have uh, an intra-conservative uh, election with only the most devoted members of the party going out to vote. It's going to be an interesting 50 days ahead of us. Ali, appreciate your time this morning. Thank you, sir. Ali Vesta of the Crisis Group. Coming up very shortly on this program, Bloomberg's Michael McKee sitting down with Atlanta Fed President Raphael Bostic. It's a busy week of Fed speak and it starts right here on Bloomberg Surveillance. Their conversation is five minutes away. Equity futures on the S&P positive here by 0.1%. Live from New York, you're watching Bloomberg Surveillance. Two hours away from the opening bell, equity futures look a little something like this on the S&P 500. Positive by 0.1% on the Nasdaq, with positive by 0.2. Four weeks of gains across the equity market on the S&P 500, the longest weekly winning streak going back to February. In the bond market, a two-year, 10-year, 30-year that looks a little something like this. Following three weeks of declining yields on a 10-year, your yield four. 41.59 and in foreign exchange after the biggest weekly gain for the euro going back to March. The euro looks like this against the US dollar. 108.63. Under surveillance this morning, our top story, Iran's president has died in a helicopter crash. Ibrahim Raisi was widely seen as a candidate to be Iran's next supreme leader. The Ayatollah is saying an election for Iran's next president will take place in the next 50 days. And Anne-Marie, it's going to be quite a 50 days for that country. Yes, absolutely. And we just heard from Ali Vez talking about the fact that now Iran is internally focused. They have to have not just a new president, a, a new cabinet, and then they're going to go to elections. And he says in that kind of circumstance, potentially Iran feels even more on the back foot and they can lash out. So we on the cusp potentially of more geopolitical tension within this region that already is very high. And it raises this question, too, of what exactly the election looks like in potentially 50 days at a time where it's not exactly the same kind of election as takes place in other places. That's the latest from the region. Let's turn to the latest on the earnings front. NVIDIA reporting earnings on Wednesday after the closing bow. The AI poster child accounting for about 5% of the S&P 500 gains so far this year. The company has seen double-digit gains in three of the past five reports. Their stock is up this morning by 1.4%. We've had upgrade after upgrade. And this morning, I think in the last 24 hours, Lisa, Barclay, Stiefel lifting their price targets for the stock. And you raise this question, I mean, has the bar been lifted so high that anything other than a $2 billion beat is considered a miss? Just want to throw this statistic out. Uh, Jim Reed over at Deutsche Bank put this out there, that in the past 12 months, the share price has tripled. And in that one day alone, one year ago when they reported earnings that really were blockbuster, it was a 20% pop in one day. It just highlights, you know, how significant this name is, not only to the index, but also as sort of a driver of the AI narrative that really kicked off a lot of the gains that we saw that were really unexpected. A double-digit move on a market cap that large is just absolutely phenomenal. And let's be clear, we've seen that across a few names over the last month or so. As where a slew of Fed speak on deck. We'll hear from Barr, Waller, Jefferson and Mester later on today. But right now, Bloomberg's Michael McKee sitting down with Atlanta Fed President Raphael Bostic. Good morning, Mike. Good morning and good morning to all of our listeners and viewers on Bloomberg Radio and Television Worldwide. We are at Amelia Island in Florida for the Financial Markets Conference of the Atlanta Fed. And the host has graciously agreed to join us this early morning. Uh, thank you for being with us. Uh, I'm not going to ask you when you're going to cut rates because nothing's probably changed in your view that it's not time yet you need more confidence and you've been the one saying maybe one later this year that's the same right nothing has changed but first of all good morning it's good <laughs> to see you and welcome to the conference it's good to have you here no th what you said is exactly right uh, the numbers have come in for the first part of this year very bumpy and it really suggests that inflation is going to come down far slower than I think many had expected. And so rather than focus on numbers of cuts and all that kind of stuff, really the issue right now is when are we going to be certain that inflation is clearly on its path of 2%? I think it's going to take a while before we'll know that for sure. Well, what is it that tells you that maybe you'll only get one or you might get no cuts this year? What do you see in the economy? Well, you know, we do a lot of talking to business leaders. And what they're all telling us is things are slowing down. But they're slowing down very slowly. 
uh, coming off of pretty high record levels of, of profits and, and revenue. So in that instance, there's going to be continued momentum in the economy, and that momentum is just going to take a while to play through. The other thing everyone tells us, though, is that uh, pricing power is weakening. They do know that the expansion and large growth is not on their, in their outlooks and on the table. And so for me, that says, yeah, it's going to slow down. It's going to get there, but it's only going to be eventual. Is it likely that inflation doesn't go down or that it could go up again? Well, as you know, anything can happen. My outlook is really that inflation will continue to fall through this year and into 2025. You know, I think that it will take quite a while for us to get all the way to 2%, but, uh, but I do think we'll get there. But of course, you know, the unexpected can always happen, and we've seen that through the last three or four years where uh, you know, the pandemic was not expected, a war in Europe wasn't expected, uh, and they do send ripples through the entire economy. If that happens, we'll just have to be ready and then respond as appropriate. One of the themes of this conference is sort of what happens next. So what happens next? Uh, you're higher for longer now, uh, and some think you're going to be higher forever, that we're not going back to low interest rates. Well, I don't think we're going to go, well, let me say this. I hope we don't go back to zero interest rates, because that means something will have happened that requires us to go to maximum support for the economy, and that would not be ideal for anybody. Uh, I do think that our new steady state is likely to be higher than what people have known over the last decade, maybe back to where we were in the 1990s and 2000s, uh, but we'll just have to see. But I do think um, a strong, an important message uh, people should have is going back to zero means that something bad happened in the economy, and we want to avoid that as much as possible. Well, what do you say to uh, people who want to move or people who want to buy a new car? Uh, hold on, wait, or uh, how long do these industries have that they can hold out until you decide what you're going to do next? Well, I don't think anyone's waiting for us at this point on, on the business side. You see in the auto space uh, that producers and, and auto dealers, they're adding incentives for people to buy their cars. You know, we talked to lots of major, major sellers of cars. They're trying to move volume. They are trying to do those things. And I think for consumers, it's really shop around. It's, just, it's like back to where we used to be and how the economy used to work. Uh, you got to go find where there are opportunities. Uh, they're out there, but you know, people just need to live their lives. And what I'm finding and, and seeing is most of them are doing that. Um, the, the housing and home ownership, uh, that's a special case, and people are locked into those. But even there, because we have uh, remote work, and we have uh, people working in these hybrid situations, there are opportunities for people uh, to continue to stay engaged in the economy. Well, a lot of people look at uh, the housing industry, for example, and other areas that have started to slow down. And there's an argument that maybe you're going to be behind the curve in cutting rates. Uh, I don't think that that's really the right way to think about it. For, for me, our mandate is stable prices and maximum employment. On the employment side, we're still seeing many, many jobs being created. On the inflation side and the stable prices, we've still got a ways to go. And so for us, and I think our, our, given our mandates, we need to get that stable price, pricing aside to where we need it to be. Because at that point, then the economy will be positioned to stand on its own, to move forward, and to create uh, growth and prosperity. When you get asked when you're going to cut rates and you give the answer that you give and your colleagues get asked and give the answer that they give. Um, you've said as, as a group that we're not doing forward guidance anymore, but is this a forward guidance uh, that you're doing anyway because it does seem like you're guiding the markets or at least the markets are reacting to everything you say? Well, I think the markets have always reacted to everything we say, so I, I don't think this is new. What I would say, though, is we are, we are open to all possibilities. And from here moving forward, there are scenarios where the economy is going to expand and accelerate. There are scenarios where the economy might slow down faster than expected. And then there is my outlook scenario, which is slow and steady uh, wins the race. In all of those cases, um, there are policy prescriptions. And we have to be ready for all of them. So in this sense, unlike in the pandemic or even the great financial crisis, when we knew that most of the risk was on one side, now the risks are really balanced and 
so there isn't sort of a bias in one direction or another. I think that's the message to be taken. If you want to call that forward guidance, that's fine. I, I mean, to me, I think in many regards, that's life. Like life is you don't know, something good could happen, something bad could happen, and you just have to be ready for it. Well, you've got uh, another month, essentially, before you have your next meeting and you have to put out your uh, forecasts. But uh, you want to give us a sneak preview of what you think growth and inflation are going to be like uh, for the rest of the year? Uh, well, I've been told many times, don't scoop yourself. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I don't know. You know what, what, the way our process works is um, as we get closer to the meeting, I meet with my team. Uh, we really try to get a sense of where everybody is on this. You know, I have a, a bunch of great economists in our, in our building who have their own views and opinions about how the economy is going to move forward. I take that on board and we'll get to a narrative uh, at that point. But uh, right now I'm just worried about uh, this conference, making sure it goes off as well as it can. And uh, I'm really looking forward you, to, to you're the You're going to be the, one of the, just one dot by yourself on the dot plot when it comes out? Uh, well, we'll see about that. <laughs> When you look at the uh, economy overall, does it surprise you still that we're seeing the strength in the labor markets that we are seeing? Are you hearing anything from CEOs about that turning? So what I've heard from, from business leaders really is that um, today, labor markets are weaker than they were, or softer than they were 12 months ago, but they're not soft. You know, this is a question that we ask all the time because uh, we need to know how um, the, the labor side of input to production is doing. Um, but I think it's really important when we think about workers and the labor, labor market is, is that before the pandemic, the labor markets were tight. Right? So I don't think we're, we're likely to evolve to a place where you know, labor is going to be, there's going to be many, many people out there uh, available for work. Uh, we're going to go back to where we were. I will say, you know, there have been lots of reports that show that immigration has been important, an important contributor. Uh, and, you know, we'll see how it, how it evolves moving forward. Well, the big question that a lot of people on Wall Street and I guess in, in a way Main Street are asking is, is monetary policy restrictive now? And is what you're restricting the problems in the, uh, for inflation? Or are, uh, is it maybe uh, stuff you can't do anything about? Well, look, I think that our stance is restrictive. Uh, one, another thing we do, we have surveys, and I ask people all the time, do you think that our policy stance is preventing some things from happening that you would do otherwise? Every business leader says yes. Now, some of them say, um, it's changed my forecast over the next 12 months. They're, they're, I have some cash, so I can actually buy some things and don't need to use debt instruments for that. But everyone acknowledges to me that, uh, that our policy rate is is slowing things down, it is tightening. Um, and that's what really gives me the confidence that uh, we can get inflation back to our 2% target. Well, as a, a last question, um, we're obviously in a season where everybody's getting asked their feelings about the economy. Do you think we see any significant changes in the economy over the next six months, say? It's hard to say. You know, I, 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 my outlook is the economy is going to continue to be growing. Uh, inflation is going to continue to come down slowly. Uh, the economy will continue to create jobs, uh, and the United States economy will continue to be the leading economy uh, in the world. You know, but will people feel that? Uh, you'll have to ask them. So, so I, I think one of the things I've heard is we don't have just one economy today. We have people that are on the lower end of the income and wealth distribution. They have spent through, gone through their excess savings. Uh, they are feeling somewhat where they the same way they were before the pandemic. Then you have a lot of other folks who accrued a lot of savings through the pandemic because they couldn't go on vacations, they couldn't go to restaurants. They're still in a spend mode. And so a lot of what I'm trying to do today is figure out how that all fits together to give a picture of how the, the aggregate economy is going to move forward. Today, what I'm hearing is that um, there's still an, a, enough spend on, the, on that upper end uh, that the economy can continue to grow, uh, but it is slowing down. Well, we will check in with you in a couple of months and see if anything's changed. Raphael Bostic, thank you very much for joining us from the Atlanta Fed and from Amelia Island. We'll send it back to you. Mike McKee, thank you, sir. Looking forward to your coverage throughout the day.
Look out for Mike catching up with the Cleveland Fed president, Loretta Mester, a little bit later on this morning. We heard this from a few guests last week. We're slowing, we're not slow. On the labor market, Raphael Bostic of the Atlanta Fed saying this, things are softer than they were, but they're not soft. Much more on that in just a moment. Let's give an update on stories this morning elsewhere. Here is your Bloomberg Brief with Danny Berger. Hey, Danny. Hey, John. Nippon Steel is stepping up efforts to gain support for its takeover of U.S. Steel. Nippon is sending its vice chair and executive VP to Pittsburgh this week, where they'll meet with local staff and elected officials. It's also sending technical teams to reveal to review U.S. steel mills. They're hoping to find ways to boost investment and labor commitments to try to win over union leaders. Nippon declined to comment on details. Testimony resumes today in the fraud and market manipulation trial of Bill Huang. Jurors have already heard witnesses say that his Archegos Capital Management lied to its Wall Street counterparties. This week, former Chief Risk Officer Scott Becker is expected to take the stand as one of the prosecution's star witnesses. He was a key contact for the banks for Archegos. The jury has been played recordings already where he reassures them the Huang's family office is fine, even as it's collapsing. Becker has pled guilty and will testify as a cooperating witness. Now, seafood chain Red Lobster has filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy after facing higher costs and a disastrous unlimited shrimp promotion. The chain struggled and failed to attack, attract customers, losing $76 million in the 2023 fiscal year. But during that year, the company also turned its endless shrimp promotion into a permanent fixture. That cost it $11 million as diners devoured plates. The bankruptcy filing allows the chain to operate while it works out a way to repay creditors. And that's your Bloomberg Brief, John. And Danny, thank you. Bramo's favorite story this morning. 100%. Right? Well, I mean, I never understood the logic behind selling lobsters and shrimp for that cheap. And then when you have unlimited shrimp, what do you think is going to happen? I mean, if you have teenagers at home who are male teenagers, you know that they look to see where they can have all you can eat. And then they go there and they see how much they can eat. Why do people not do that also for Red Lobster? I'm looking at one article that talks about the fact that they did this in 2003. And this is what executives had to say to analysts in 2003. It wasn't the second helping of an all you can eat, but the third that hurt profits. So then why are they doing it again? As a promotion, I get it, get people in. As a permanent fixture, it's a very different thing. I used to do the same thing with pizza. Of course. You know, but pizza, I imagine, is much cheaper to make than ordering in shrimp. So there are always the stories of the all you can eat places and then at what point you get kicked out. That's a dare among teenagers. If they can get kicked out of all you can eat places among some circles. I'm not saying. The boy's been going to Red Lobster. I'm just not. No, no, no. Okay. No. All right. I'm next on the program. Is in line the new B. From here, it could be this benign environment where you have um, a Fed reaction function that we think is a bit more dovish, some relief on the inflation front, and uh, that's very constructive for credit heading into the summer. That conversation up next, live from New York. You're watching Bloomberg Surveillance. Live from New York, welcome to the program. Equity futures on the S&P 500. Just to check in on the scores, look like this. We're positive by 0.16%. Under surveillance this morning is in line, the new B. As you saw with CPI, just getting something in line was enough to really see a lot of relief in markets, a rally in credit um, included. I think from here, it could be this benign environment where you have um, a Fed reaction function that we think is a bit more dovish, some relief on the inflation front, and uh, that's very constructive for credit heading into the summer. That's the bullish outlook. Here's the latest this morning. Light on data and heavy on Fed speak this week. Atlanta Fed President Rafael Bostic saying just moments ago, rather than focus on numbers, the issue right now is when we are going to get certain that inflation is on its path to 2%, I think it's going to take a while before we know that for sure. Amanda Lyon of BlackRock joins us around the table. Amanda, good morning to you. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Great to hear from the Atlanta Fed President about 10, 15 minutes ago with Michael McKee. This is what he had to say on the question of being restrictive. He said that he would ask corporations the question, is it preventing you from doing something you would do otherwise? And overwhelmingly, they'd respond yes. Do you think we are restrictive? I think that we're restrictive in certain pockets of the market, but I think in general, corporates are still moving ahead with what they need to be doing. I think the one uh, area of concern, I think, for corporate credit is um, there's a lot of focus on the timing of rate cuts, and it seems like the market's expectation is that once this rate cut cycle begins, it's going to be a deep rate cutting cycle. My question is, what if we stop at 4%? 
What if we stop in the high threes and we're there for a long time? Does that start to change the corporate calculus? I've been encouraged to see that actually high yield corporates are now chipping away at late 2025, early 2026 maturities. So I think they're saying we're not waiting for this near term significant rate relief. We're going to kind of move on with it. Um, the one area where you are seeing, I think, maybe activity be subdued to the rate environment is in LBO activity. So not strategic M&A, but kind of sponsor related M&A, where the financing decisions are more of a, I think, integral calculus to the returns. Strategic M&A has actually rebounded quite nicely. So I think in general, yes, there are pockets that we've discussed previously. Um, you can find them in liquid and private credits of companies, uh, companies I think, underperforming. Um, and that, that probably won't turn anytime soon. But my bigger focus is, again, not on the timing of the rate cutting cycle, but how far do we go in rate cuts? And that will really matter for corporate credit. The base case is we begin in the second half, but you've said it a few times, not all rate cuts are created equally. Can we talk about that a little bit more? Sure. And, and so that that is an admittedly wide six month range. I mean, I, uh, and previously we had been guiding towards the earlier part of that. In mid-April, we changed it to say that actually the risks are quite balanced between the earlier and the later part of that six month range. Yes, not all rate cuts are created equal. So if we're getting rate cuts because of a deterioration in the labor market, uh, that is an environment where I would expect credit spreads to be much wider because th these are growth sensitive asset classes. If we're getting rate cuts because of an improvement in inflation, which so far has been somewhat elusive, except for April, maybe, um, then that's a much more benign outcome for credit. Uh, by that same token, if we are not getting rate cuts until very late in 2024 or early 2025, because growth is just so strong, credit can digest that. Uh, but it's really that sustained reacceleration in inflation that is really the concern, because at that point, it introduces credence to the prospect of a rate hike. And that uncertainty for monetary policy is just really not good for credit, specifically that deal making. To your point, Raphael Bostic just saying going back to zero, uh, zero rates means something bad happened in the economy. So in terms of not all rate cuts are created equal, the balance of risks, though, has shifted. And you really outline this well in the sense that the high yield market has basically termed out a lot of its debt. You've seen the supply really shrink in terms of just the total outstanding debt. Private credit's not that story, though, and you are seeing covenants loosing. You're starting to see a little bit more leniency by lenders as the competition heats up. At what point does this become a problem? Sure. So uh, first on the on the high yield supply, you're absolutely right. And one of the stats that I found striking, 77 percent of the year to date high yield new issue volumes, which actually are elevated, were earmarked for debt repayment or refinancing. So it just goes to show you that corporates are being prudent. Actually, in private credit, we track an index. It's the Lincoln International Private Market index. It's 5,000 U.S. portfolio companies. Uh, somewhat counterintuitively, covenant defaults have declined for four consecutive quarters through the first quarter of 2024. Now, part of that is the increased flexibility that those corporates have. So around 16 percent of those companies in that universe got an amendment from their lender. But I do think it speaks to this um, inherent flexibility in the long term lender relationship that for all uh, else being equal, a same company with the same macro backdrop, same business model, are they better placed to make it through the other side in the private markets versus the public markets. We think that the private markets afford them that flexibility. The good news is it doesn't sound like there's some mass, uh, massive wave of defaults that some people had worried about when rates went up. The bad news is, is Fed policy really effective? Is this actually working through the economy if there's so many other ways for people to finance? Right. I think it goes back to kind of this overarching point of how unique this cycle is. Um, in previous cycles, if you would have looked at tightening in bank lending, rate hikes of 525 basis points, you would have expected a corporate default rate in the 9, 10 percent range. Instead, we're hovering around five and a half to six percent, depending on the asset class in the region. So I think it just it does speak to the fact that corporates entered this position from a position of strength in terms of the high interest rate environment. They've refinanced in 2020 and 2021. They have other avenues for funding in terms of the private markets. And in some areas, the market, the, the economy has not been as interest sensitive as we would have expected. Again, there are pockets of vulnerability. For sure, we're seeing that across the board. Um, you can find those in a lot of places. But yes, I, I do think it speaks to the unique nature of the cycle. The one thing that we're really watching is, um, you know, that that is true so far, kind of uh, two years and change into an elevated uh, cost of capital. What if that is a, a common feature throughout 
2025. How do corporates behave in that? At some point, I think what matters in both private and liquid credit, if you're lending to a company, are you lending to a company that can grow in a cost-efficient way, in a capital-efficient way, or are they just kept afloat by what was previously a low-rate environment that we don't expect? To How pursue? temporary is this? And that's yeah. kind of what you're getting at. So let's go through one of those themes, sources of finance. Yes. How structural is this? Is this a permanent shift where they can get access to finance beyond where they just used to get it? Yes. I mean, I, I do think a big part of the growth in private markets is permanent. And, and the key differentiator is that while the idea of middle market lending is not new, that's been around for decades, as a standalone, sizable, scalable asset class, we believe it's here to stay. And so in that instance, this asset class can compete in areas where it previously couldn't, like overlapping with the addressable market of public borrowers. And so I do think that is here to stay. Now, that will ebb and flow, that competition between public and private markets where companies choose to access funding. But I, on net, I think that's a positive. But again, the important thing will be, are these companies growing in a capital efficient way? Can they actually make it through the other side? Or were they the so-called zombies that were kept afloat by a low rate environment? And no one should be lending really to those companies in public or, or private markets. Amanda, I say this every time you come on, one of the best. It's good to see you. Thank you. Amanda Lynham there of BlackRock. Coming up in the next hour of Bloomberg Surveillance, we'll catch up with Phil Camparelli of JP Morgan, the Ryanair CEO, Michael O'Leary, Stephanie Roth of Wolf Research, and Mark McCormick of TD. From New York with futures just about positive, this is Bloomberg. We're getting closer to a point where we might actually see cuts this year. We're still looking for easing now to begin in September. The Fed put is still alive and well in people's minds. A more credible bear case would be a reacceleration inflation. If it's not a trend down, in fact, it is just inflation hanging out where it is, then I think they keep postponing. Is the inflation target the right target? We all talk about wanting to go back to 2%. 2% is totally arbitrary. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Perro, Lisa Abramowitz, and Anne-Marie Hordern. The third hour of Bloomberg Surveillance begins right now. Getting your trading week started with equity futures just about positive on the S&P 500. Good morning, good morning to you all. The Fed speak has already started this week. We caught up with the Atlanta Fed President, Raphael Bostic, sitting down with Michael McKee. The takeaway from that is what we've heard a lot already over the last week or so. We're slowing, but we're not slow. Labor markets are softer, but at least they're not soft. And guess what? We don't really know any anything. And guess what? That's life, because we don't really know what's going to come around the corner. The one thing that really stuck out to me is going back to zero I means something bad happened in the economy, going to Amanda Lynham's point. Not all rate cuts are created equal, and they're not sure what kind they might be doing. It's going to be an odd couple of weeks because on Wednesday you get NVIDIA, then after NVIDIA there's basically nothing for like two weeks after NVIDIA going into CPI. Because on June 12th there's everything. You have CPI and the Federal Reserve and a ton of other things happening that week too. But when it comes to NVIDIA this week, Jonathan, this is the stat that stands out to me. Analysts expect NVIDIA grew earnings by more than 400% in the prior quarter while revenue increased 242%. That has to do with Bloomberg consensus data. And when you think about coming into this earnings, whether NVIDIA does well or not can really spell what's going to happen, whether this market is fine or not so fine towards the end of the week. Lisa, the data point of the week apparently. Yeah, NVIDIA. I actually think that it might be the 20-year auction on Wednesday of uh, Treasuries. $60 that would be very on brand. That would be, I mean, you never know. Supply <laughs> might matter in a week, uh, you know, in a week, uh, day, week of um, uh, economic data. I actually am very curious to hear what happens with Chris Waller on Friday. I know not all Fed speak is created equal, just like not all rate cuts are created equal. Do they really address the idea of where the longer-term inflation rate really is at a time where people are saying, including Mohamed Alarian last week with you guys, uh, that it's structurally going to be high? and you have to kind of just embrace that. Governor Wallace set the tone for this committee before, did that last year. Be interested to see if he does the same thing later on this week as well. Let's start with the scores this hour. Equity futures on the S&P 500, just about positive by 0.15%. In the bond market, yields just about unchanged on a 10-year 4.41. In foreign exchange, the euro slightly negative against a stronger dollar, 108.61. Coming up this hour, we'll catch up with JP Morgan's Phil Camparelli on why nervousness around rates is overblown. Ryanair CEO Michael O'Leary in 
in the building on the ongoing impact of Boeing delivery delays and what's happening with prices this summer for flights. And Stephanie Roth of Wolf Research on her outlook for slowing inflation. We begin with our top story. Stocks edging higher following four weeks of gains. JP Morgan's Phil Camperetti saying this. Stocks trading at all-time highs after reducing the number of cuts in 24 from six to less than two is a really good sign. We do not think the economy needs an imminent cut in rates. And importantly, we are not counting on an ease to validate our overweight. Phyllis are with us around the table. Phil, good morning. Good morning. Last time we spoke, you were super upbeat about bonds and stocks. Has that changed? Yeah, and to be clear, it was our overweight uh, to credit on the bond markets. We'd much, much rather play offense in fixed income than defense uh, with our view of the U U.S. economy staying out of recession. Yes, we still are overweight stocks. And I think the biggest uh, p point for us here, if you can get the U.S. consumer right, John, you can get your asset allocation right. And our U.S. consumer today, and I, and I hate to say this, but this time is in fact different, John. So why? Um, this is the first time since 1984 that the federal funds rate is higher than the average effective mortgage rate. And I went back and looked at this, and I love this stat. The, the Fed is charging 5.5%. The consumer is paying zero interest rate policy. <laughs> so the average mortgage rate, effective mortgage rate, that folks were paying from 2008 to 2015 when we were in a zero interest rate policy was about 4.3%. The effective mortgage rate today is 3.8%. That's really important. And the other piece is the high yield market. If you, know, if you were a homeowner, you refinanced your mortgage uh, in the pandemic. If you were a CFO, you went into the office and you refinanced your corporate balance sheet. John, only 2% of the high yield index is coming up for maturity this year. Only 2%, only 6% next year. You gotta go out a couple of years for, 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 to get some, some serious issuance on the high yield side. On the high yield side. Now, I think the economy is enormously interest rate insensitive. We know that, that's why we're not in recession. But here's the other piece. You don't need an interest rate cut. What's an interest rate cut going to do to validate your overweight to stocks and bonds? And I think that's why the last couple of weeks were so important to us. The bigger signal is the move index or interest rate volatility, not the number of cuts that are being priced in. Because we've just had six straight quarters of above trend growth. We'll see where the first quarter comes out sure. at a time when we had high interest rates. That's a, this, this signal is really important. Let's unpack some of this. Let's sure. talk about whether they are truly restrictive or not. Mm -hmm. When you hear Fed officials say, we are restrictive. Yeah. What are you thinking? Yeah, so uh, not as restrictive as they probably believe at this point. So there's a couple of things on one side of the balance sheet. There's a $7 trillion Fed balance sheet, and there's a 7% U.S. fiscal deficit. And, and we just talked about how interest rate insensitive the U.S. consumer is. I think maybe for speculation, they're probably restrictive. But in terms of getting folks to stop spending, I don't think they're as restrictive as, as they might think they are. But that's a high class problem, John. It means that we're not going into a recession. I mean, you can get to 2% inflation in a hurry, in a hard landing. But I think this is going to be a really, really lagged, probably the most lagged uh, effect of monetary policy that we've ever seen because of just how unique this, this cycle was. Yeah, as we were speaking, I was thinking to myself, everything is fine because Fed policy doesn't work. Is that basically <laughs> the way that we can kind of frame this? Uh, it won't work, Lisa, if we get accelerating inflation. And I think that's that's where you got, we have to draw the line. So Jerome Powell in his last, in his last uh, press conference really raised the bar for them coming to back in and hike. They'd have to see significant evidence that their policy is not restrictive. I don't think you can go there yet until you get and this is important, wages picking up. And I think the wage story being at or around 4% around long-term targets, this is just a really good environment to take risk. And if wages aren't accelerating, I think they could be on, they on hold for a while. I guess one thing that I've been doing recently mm -hmm. is talking to different people who I engage with about how are you feeling about the economy, truly. Yeah. Because I've been curious about this idea that people have been feeling pretty crappy about it, frankly, <laughs> even though the economic data points to something different. And it's uniform. People do not feel good because of the level of inflation. Mm -hmm. The people who feel good, who are wealthy, they feel good, right? But everybody else is really kind of struggling. Yeah. So at what point is allowing inflation to run hot and to even entertaining the idea of rate cuts actually making it more difficult for a certain subset that really is flat on its back and is rate sensitive, very much so. Yeah, Lisa, we are 
we are 100% uh, in agreement with that. Like, I'm talking about an asset allocation decision and the U.S. economy avoiding recession. But there are folks, and we see it in our card data, where delinquencies are picking up in kind of the lower income cohorts and the lower ages. That stuff is happening. It just, I don't think, is enough, Lisa, to drive the economy into two consecutive quarters of negative GDP with negative job creation. So how much do you lean into that story and just mm -hmm. go straight luxury, go straight basically everything that's catering to people who are wealthy, to people who want to lose weight, thank you, Ozempic, <laughs> to people uh, who are on the chip train, yep. and just ignore the rest? Yeah, it's not ignore the rest. I, I think the big secular, the global secular themes are something that we're focused on. So you mentioned AI and obesity drugs, and, and we don't have to stay in the U.S. I mean, 40% of NVIDIA supply comes from Taiwan Semiconductor, as you mentioned. You can't watch a, a sports game without seeing, or live TV at least, without seeing an Ozempic commercial, which is obviously outside of the U.S. So, you know, those are big secular themes that we're focused on in our, in our, in our portfolios, but it's not just that. Again, I can't stress enough, if you don't have a recession view, things like high yield credit make a lot of sense. Not because we get this incredible spread, but because we're getting extra yield over the ag, Lisa. So we are focused on those big secular themes, but as an asset allocator, I have to think about stocks and bonds. And within bonds, we still like the high yield. Can we just get within stocks just a little yeah. bit more, mm -hmm. away from AI, and yeah. away from weight loss? Mm -hmm. What is it you do like? Is this a broad, equal weight S&P 500 story? What yeah, is good it? question, John. So I'm man I have to manage against a, a global index, a Morgan Stanley All Country World Index. So in that, in that world, we have about a 6% of weight to stocks, so in a 60, 40 type portfolio, that's a 66% allocation to stocks. Two thirds of that overweight are in the US, S&P, okay? And then the balance of that, we have an overweight to develop non-US, so we do like the European story, we mentioned a couple of those themes, we do like Japan, and then we're neutral emerging markets. Quietly emerging markets are making a little bit of a comeback. Not necessarily willing to go overweight yet because we like the, the US and the developed non-US story a little bit more, but we would not be underweight emerging markets here. Is that a China factor, in the end, that holds you back a little bit? Yeah, so it's it certainly is. So there's a there's a there's a uh, amount of confidence that we cannot get to yet with emerging markets driven by the China story that we can get to in the U.S. and, and non-U.S. markets. You're not alone. Yeah. Over the weekend. Thank you. Yeah, Appreciate I mean, like, well, I mean, <laughs> anytime. It's fine. Yeah. It's come fine and yeah. dandy, as Stuart Kaiser would say. Now, here, here's the issue, right? A lot of people have been talking about emerging markets as part of this reflation trade, and the commodity sector is part of that, too. Yeah. And what I find interesting is where are the limits to this where suddenly this becomes a problem, right? Where the reflation trade, I know, I'm always mm -hmm. looking for the problems, but yeah. I guess that <laughs> okay. that's, you know, what people do. Yeah. But I'm just wondering, at what point do you start seeing some of the increase in commodity prices is a headwind, uh, especially if you are worried about some of the strength being a little bit too strong and you are worried about the idea of inflation rearing again. Yeah, so Lisa, there's like a, a line in the sand and most people think it's $100 oil or something like that, that we would start to think that that would be kind of like a tax. Whereas, you know, we have a long way to go to get there, but also in emerging markets, they've been so beat up and so left behind that any reflation right now is good for that for that market. But there is a point, obviously, right, where the commodity story then becomes the tax. We're not close to that yet, and we're really, there's two things that look cheap. One of them is emerging markets, the other one is small cap. We don't want to be underweight either of those, but small cap, I think you would really need to see multiple Federal Reserve cuts with above trend growth which is not our, our, our view. So we'd rather be avoid large cap versus small cap. Phil, you go right to oil, but really the commodity story is yep. metals right now. Yes. Copper, mm -hmm. the record we've seen overnight mm -hmm. in London. Isn't that a concern, given what we are seeing in terms of the changing economies in the United States, in Asia, mm -hmm. also in Europe? Uh, so we have actually upgraded our view, Anne-Marie, for precious metals in our long-term capital market assumption. Why? Because... You know, the last cycle was not the new normal. We think that over the next decade, Emory, we're going to see two-way risk on inflation the way we always saw it before 2008. But, you know, in the post-financial crisis, there was only a one-way risk getting inflation to 2%. So I think the precious metal story makes sense in a structural asset allocation based on the view that you may not get the protection that you necessarily have been used to getting in fixed income, so you make room for precious metals. Phil, this was great. It's good to see you, buddy. You Always too. is. Upbeat. More than just fine. Phil Camparelli of JP Morgan on both bonds and equities. Put this one in the diary for this morning. A little bit later on, 11 a.m. San Francisco time. Ed Ludlow catching up with the CEOs of Dell, NVIDIA and ServiceNow. Jensen Huang 
with Ed Ludlow a little bit later. All I can think of is Dan Ives' description of Jensen Huang. Uh, come on, you know, the, the rock star, he gets his leather jacket on, he goes on the stage and he does what he does and he talks about how incredible their business model is. We'll hear about that later. And Marcus got 20%, exactly. just like that. <laughs> Let's much. get you an update on stories elsewhere this morning. Carisha Bloomberg Brief with Danny Berger. Hey, Danny. Hey, John. One of Wall Street's most prominent bears has just capitulated. Morgan Stanley's Mike Wilson now sees the S&P rising 2% by June of next year. So he's boosted his target to 5,400 from 45 500, which would have been a 15% drop. Wilson and the Morgan Stanley team say that they expect a sunny macro environment, but Wilson did reiterate his view that outcomes are harder to predict with volatile data. He had said last month that he was steering clear of big calls given that economic uncertainty. Mike Wilson joins surveillance at 8 a.m. tomorrow Eastern. Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman is postponing a trip to Japan due to concerns about his father, the king's health. The trip was set to begin today and would have been the Crown Prince's first visit to Japan in five years. Saudi state media reported that the 88-year-old king is suffering from inflammation of the lung. MBS, who handles most day-to-day -day affairs in the kingdom, is next in the line to the throne. And Jeff Bezos' Blue Origin resumes sending tourists to space. It launched six private passengers on a flight more than 60 miles from Earth. It's the company's seventh tourist mission on New Shepard to date, and it's first since August 2022. And that's your Bloomberg Brief. John. Danny, thank you. More from Danny in about 30 minutes' time. Up next, the morning calls, plus Ryanair CEO Michael O'Leary looking ahead to summer travel demand. Here in New York, Michael O'Leary, up next. from New York City, equity futures positive here by 0.2%, a little lift on the S&P 500 in the bond market, yields unchanged at 441.59. Time now for the morning calls. First up, Barclays raising its price target on NVIDIA to 1100. The analysts seeing $1 billion in upside for first quarter data center revenue. A stock is up by 1.3%. Next up, Morgan Stanley upgrading Micron to equal weight. The analysts pointing to strengthening demand for AI related products. And finally, Jefferies initiating coverage on US Steel with a buy rating, $45 price target. The analysts highlighting a positive macro backdrop for the metals and mining sector thanks to ongoing US economic strength. That stock is up by 1.2%. Let's turn to travel. Shares of Ryanair lower this morning with the airline saying some affairs may be flat despite low capacity. Ryanair planning to offer discounts to stimulate demand and the CEO, good friend of ours over the years, Michael O'Leary joins us for more. Michael, good morning to you and welcome to New York. Morning, John. Great pleasure to be here again. Great to catch up with you, sir. So let's talk about pricing. Yeah. Your own CFO said it was counterintuitive. Help me understand it. Capacity's down, prices are flat. What's mm. going on? I, I, difficult to understand it ourselves. Like we, 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 we've come off two summers of 20% plus price increases. So we thought pricing this year would be softer. We thought up five to 10. At the moment, it looks like it's flat to 5% through the summer peak. I think there's just a bit of consumer resistance out there. Capacity is constrained in Europe. We thought that would lead to stronger pricing. Easter was early. That means that April, May, June is a little bit softer. We still see pricing up in, through the peak, July, August, September. We're constrained because of Boeing delivery delays. But I think pricing is going to be softer than we had originally expected this summer. Good for consumers, not necessarily quite so good for shareholders, but then we've launched a 700 million share buyback today, so that'll keep shareholders quiet while we look after consumers all summer long. It's just to be clear, this trend for summer then, soft right now, but you do expect prices to increase, fares to increase as the summer progresses? Yeah, there's no doubt in the, the, the April, May, June quarter, pricing is down on the prior year. Now, we had a full Easter in April, this year with only half an Easter there. Pricing still looks, but it's up, but it's up small, it's very weak, at zero to 5% through July, August, September. We've only sold about 40% of the seats in that quarter, so it could still be up slightly higher, it could be lower. 
We're reasonably relaxed. We have costs well under control. We've hedged our fuel forward for the next year. We've saved $450 million on fuel for the next 12 months. So we can use that to stimulate uh, pricing. And when we've done some price stimulation in recent weeks, we've seen very strong responses for consumers. So I think consumers are there. They're a little bit nervous. Spending is weak. But when you give them a price incentive, uh, volumes, uh, the volumes are very strong. Does this take some of the pressure off the 23 uh, deliveries of Boeing jets that you're waiting for that could be delayed? Because ultimately, capacity is less of an issue. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't think so, Lisa. I mean, I would prefer to take the aircraft. We could fill those aircraft through the peaks. Of the, if through July, August, September, we think travel will be strong, pricing will be strong. We regret the fact that we'll be 20 aircraft short. We've crewed up, so we have all the pilots and the cabin crew. Our labor will be a little bit higher in that second quarter, but volume's lower. We've had to pare back our full year traffic forecast this year from 205 million to about 200 million passengers. So it doesn't really help because everything, we're geared up for the, for, the, for the growth and we're just going to be, let, uh, Boeing going to leave us 20 aircraft short. You've always been known for being incredibly cost conscious, trying to bring a lower cost to the consumer. Are you trying to get a deal on some of these Boeing jets? Are you looking to maybe buy some from others or, you know, say, if you want to shift to Airbus, that's fine. I'll take your uh, MAX 737 jet. Well, we've already said when United came out with those stupid comments earlier in the year, you know, we're not going to take those uh, MAX 10s uh, uh, or MAX aircraft. We'll take them. If you don't want them, we'll take them. Did of course. You? Yeah, no. They kind of, <laughs> they mumbled and then decided they were going to take him anywhere. Look, aircraft deliveries are incredibly tight. Airbus and Boeing are running way behind on their deliveries. There's a real capacity constraint story in Europe for the next couple of summers. Manufacturers are delayed. Airbus fleet is, 20% of the Airbus fleet is grounded because of the Pratt & Whitney engine issue. And U Europe is an Airbus market. So capacity is constrained. Why it's a little bit surprising, pricing is soft this summer. We thought pricing would be a little bit stronger because of those capacity constraints. But hey, if the consumers are um, a little bit pr more price conscious, if they're a little bit more price sensitive, we'll stimulate. It's good for our business because we're the lowest price provider. Michael, what are you hearing from Boeing at the moment? Because in the past, you said you thought the deliveries could slip further. How much further are we talking? Well, Anne-Marie, good question. I, mean, I think two things. One, we're 20 aircraft behind. We're supposed to get 59 aircraft for this summer. We're only going to get 39 at best. But I, we do see signs of improvement in recent weeks. I think Stephanie Pope and the new team in Seattle are doing a good job. They're taking fuselages are not being taken from Wichita unless they're completely uh, defect-free. But we're not yet seeing a speed up in the turnaround times in Seattle. They're still taking 12, 14 weeks to produce an aircraft, whereas it should really be 8 to 10. Now, two weeks ago, they sent us an update. We were expecting two deliveries in June, three in July. We're getting two in June. It looks like seven in July. So we're beginning to see the situation improve, but it's very small baby steps. We're still going to take aircraft through August, September and October, even though we can't fly them during those months. Uh, we think we get all 59 aircraft in this calendar year. And then the big issue with us at Boeing is will we get the 29 aircraft deliveries? You, we are contracted to deliver us between January and April of 2025. So I think they're making small, pro, uh, small steps, little progress, but we don't want to see any further bad news. If that's your big question going into next year, then how do you weigh the impact on what does that mean for your business for 2025? I think at the moment it means that for 2020, for FY20, March 25, we're going to be doing 200 million passengers instead of 205 million. For March 26 or summer 25, we think we can step that up. I think we'll get most of those aircraft from Boeing and then we'd like to see ourselves grow to probably about 215 million passengers through summer 25 into March 26. We think there'll be a strong rebound. We still think pricing will be reasonably robust across Europe because capacity is going to be constrained. Airbus and Boeing can't deliver any additional aircraft. The engine man issue is a huge problem for the Airbus fleet. You know, they've been talking about 350 days to repair these engines. We think it's going to be four, 500 days. So a lot of Airbus aircraft are going to be grounded for the next two or three years. How much do you see, just going back to this idea of pricing power, and that we're surprised that there's not greater degree yeah. of pricing power given some of the constraints with deliveries. How much is this sort of the end of the boom that we saw in the travel and that people are constrained by the fact that, you know, hotel prices have tripled. You can see that any restaurant you go to is that much more expensive. <laughs> Anytime you travel, I mean, it's incredibly yeah. expensive. So how much have we sort of reached the tipping point where we're going back to something that's pre-pandemic and not this you can work anywhere and travel all the time kind of mentality? I mean, I don't think we've reached that. I think Europe is a fundamental different market to the US. North America, you've seen a lot of pr travel price inflation in the last uh, couple of years. You know, the average fare Southwest charged last week, last year was $170. The average fare in Ryanair across Europe was 48 euros. 
So there's still a bit to go in Europe, but there's no doubt in my mind that the European consumer is cutting spend, is, is, is careful, they're cautious, they want price stimulation. We, you know, we go out with seed sales, we sell out straight away. But you know, we have higher interest rates, uh, in government's cutting back on inflation. I think consumers are just a little bit nervous there at the moment. I don't think that's a longer term trend. I think you know, interest rates will fall, if not this year, through into next year. I think we will see some rebound in consumer spending. But I think they, you know, they will protect travel. The experiential spend will continue. It'll just trend down to the lowest cost provider, which in Europe is Ryanair. Is this a time to get more aggressive and go after market share in certain geographies? I would love to. If I could get more aircraft out of Boeing, I'd be on it like a rash. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, we are taking more market share, though, at the moment in Central and Eastern Europe. Wiz have grounded 45 aircraft. Nobody else is expanding in Europe. So we are winning huge amounts of market share, despite the fact that our own capacity growth is constrained by Boeing delivery delays. So we're taking market share. I think that will continue. Um, but if I could get more aircraft, I would, uh, I would try and grow faster at the moment, albeit at the cost of lower airfares. You've got a good read on the consumer. Do they care what plane they fly on? No. I mean, most don't know what plane they're flying on. I don't know what plane I'm flying on most of the time. Do you not check? No. I mean, if you look at it, you know, whether it's the, uh, the Boeing NGs, the Boeing Max, I mean, I prefer to fly on a Boeing Max aircraft only because A, it's materially quieter, and I know that plane is burning about 16% less fuel than those the older fuel guzzly 737 NGs. Boeing are making great aircraft. They are getting a lot of unfair publicity in the last 12 months. You think so? You know, a nose wheel falls off an What's air... What's been unfair about it? A nose wheel falls off an Air Canada aircraft or an engine cowl comes off a Southwest and it's a Boeing aircraft. Slight, slightly concerning, no? Yeah, but it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a maintenance issue for those airlines. It's not fundamentally a 737 issue. The 737 is a great airplane. They're making phenomenal new engines. I mean, the engine technology is being transformed. We can't wait to get the MAX 10s. We're due to get the first of them in 2017. They'll carry 20% more passengers but burn 20% less fuel. So not alone will it transform our economics, but it will make us a much better, more greener, cleaner airline to fly on. Michael, it's good to see you. John, good to see you. Thank Anne you, Lisa, Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. Bless. Michael O'Leary there, the Ryanair CEO. Equity futures positive by 0.1%. Live from New York, this is Bloomberg. Sixty minutes away from the opening bow with equity futures right here on the S&P, positive by 0.1 percent on the Nasdaq up by 0.2, just about unchanged on the Russell. Following another week of gains across the board here in the equity market, Mike Wilson and Morgan Stanley making the headlines. New price target, 5,400. Old price target, 4,500. That's quite an upgrade from Mr. Wilson over at Morgan Stanley. At a certain point, you have to kind of go to where the market has gone, which is that basically earnings have been better than a lot of people expected. You're seeing earnings growth after the first quarter. They're about on par to where they were in the fourth quarter. We're looking at about 7% earnings per share growth, which is kind of uh, in line or a little bit more than people previously expected. Uh, do you think Dubravko and Marco over at JP Morgan are up next? I think so. I mean, that's the loan, the loan sort of bearish call out here. 4,200. 4,200. And what gets us there? What weakness are we going to get that can suddenly you know completely torpedo the momentum we've seen this market has got away from a lot of people bear in mind where we were only back in september october time steve chevron was with us from federated earlier on this morning we kicked off the morning with him and he said he had a price target of what was it 5200 something yeah. like that price target was made in september 4400 on the s p 500 completely different time you're talking about upside of 15 20 percent back then and uh, we've got a very different story now. The idea that 5,200 is a bearish call now because it yeah. means that the market has to go down at a time when you have to wonder what's going to torpedo it. The bigger takeaway to me, and honestly, to me, the discussions that we've had this morning and for the past couple of months, Fed policy has not been very effective. As much as people want to say it's restrictive, for the overall macro economy, you're not seeing it be effective in the same kind of way that it has historically. Let's turn to the bond market, Lisa, and look at yields. Just quickly, two-year, 10-year, 30-year. 10-year at the moment, 443.74. Yields up by about a basis point on a two-year, just about unchanged at 483.29. Over the last three weeks or so, the trend has been clear, particularly at the long end on a 10-year. Yields have been declining for three straight weeks. In foreign exchange, you want to finish on the euro for you. The euro, again, 
against the dollar at 108.56, negative by 0.1%. The dollar right now against the bulk of G10 is stronger, with the exception of the Swedish krona, for whatever that's worth to you, going into the opening bound at about one hour's time. Thanks. Under surveillance this morning, Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi killed in a helicopter crash. State news agencies confirming his death, along with the country's foreign minister. After rescuers spent hours trying to locate the crash site, the chopper went down in Iran's mountainous northwest region after dense fog covered the area on Sunday. Anne-Marie saw some of the pictures coming out over the weekend. No wonder they couldn't find that chopper. And they had a call in the likes of Turkey to go help them to find this helicopter that had Raisi, had Hossein Amir building on, the foreign minister as well, who was the main conduit, Jonathan, remember, in 2023, to really have that rapprochement with Saudi Arabia. So now what you have is an Iran that's going to be looking internal. You have the vice president coming up, and he'll be a caretaker, and they will announce elections in the next 50 days. The next 50 days. A lot to watch in that country. I want to turn to this story. Nippon Steel is not giving up. It's looking to sweeten its proposed U.S. steel takeover. Japan's top steelmaker is sending its vice chair to Pittsburgh this week to meet with local staff and politicians. It's also sending technical teams to review U.S. steel mills in an effort to boost investment and labor commitments to try to win over union leaders. It's not just union leaders they need to win over, Bramo, and that's the problem. Part of this feels to me like how much time do you bide and how much of the road work do you sort of lay before the election? The election happens and then you can get it done. Basically, that before the election, there's no way because President Biden has made it pretty clear and he doesn't really want to let a foreign company buy a U.S. steel company because it falls under national security and all sorts of different arguments that we've heard. But afterwards... Nah, a lot of people are saying it probably will go through. Well, also depends in the White House, right? Trump has also vowed to not let this deal go through. Biden's words recently when he went to Pittsburgh was, this is an iconic American company for more than a century and it should remain totally American. Trying to get the unions on side to try and change that story. Good luck to them. Another busy week of Fed speak on deck. Bostick, Barr, Waller, Jefferson, Mester kicking things off later on today. Investors also looking ahead to the minutes from the last Fed meeting, jobless claims and you, Mitch, consumer sentiment. Joining us now to discuss around the table, Stephanie Roth of Wolf Research together with Mark McCormick of TD Security. Stephanie, first to you. We heard from the Atlanta Fed president about an hour ago. He said things were softer in the labor market. They weren't soft. Would you agree? Absolutely. We've seen a softening. The latest payrolls print was arguably a Goldilocks type of print where you had a 175 payrolls number, which is good by historical measures, and an average hourly earnings print that was on the softer side. We're starting to see some signs of softening. I have to say there are some concerns in the market out there that all of a sudden the labor market's going to start to crack, and there are no signs of that. I think people are just taking the narrative and running and taking the opposite of what we saw in Q1 and, and flipping it upside down. So that's not a, a fair characterization either. Realistically, we're just seeing a rebalancing in the labor market that's actually working out fairly well and part driven by immigration. Mark, to bring you into the conversation, should we flip Q1 upside down? Is that what Q2, Q3, Q4 has in store for us? No, I would agree. I think a big part of it is the market's kind of taking what's a positioning and a technical narrative and they're overlaying it into fundamentals and you're seeing Maybe some reversal, but if you look at some of the more important prints as well, like employment cost index, if you look at some of the other uh, indicators that we track on inflation, there's no sign here that inflation is cracking. And to me, if, if you look in the details, it's still pretty robust and is relatively strong. So I think also if you put it in line with where the Fed's supposed to be, Fed is basically looking for 15 basis points month over month to basically get their 2.6% year over year. And it looks like even PCE, core PCE is tracking about 25 basis points right now. So it still feels like there's a very big disconnect. Stephanie, do you agree with that, that there's this idea that reflation or sort of a, a resurgence of an inflationary wave is the biggest risk right now and looks more and more feasible given the backdrop? It's definitely the biggest risk. Is it one that I'm particularly concerned about? No, because the inflation data are starting to look a lot better. Q1 was certainly driven by seasonals, in, in my opinion. Powell seems to believe that as well, although in the latest press conference he probably couldn't lean on that. But what we're starting to see is a real normalization in, in inflation, and the latest print told us that. And I think this was the most important clean read of, of inflation that we've gotten this year because seasonals were really driven up, driving up Q, Q1 inflation, and April was, was a lot better. So now we're tracking core PC of the 25 basis points. If we just get OER coming back down a little bit and, serve, and financial services, then you'll be back down towards 0.2%. 0.2% month on month, and that's exactly what the Fed is looking for. So it's very easy come the summer months to actually be tracking along those lines. 
And then the Fed should be able to be comfortable cutting in, say, September. Even though you do still see this uh, resurgence underneath the hood of just some sort of stickier inflation, commodity prices getting a little hotter, Mark, from your perspective, you're talking about how that's your fear. At what point is this driving flows internationally into the U.S. at a time when some people are saying, well, a weaker dollar can actually make sense? And other people say, well, just hold on a second, because on a relative basis, rates are so much higher in the U.S., strength is there, and the Fed won't be able to cut as much as, say, the ECB. Yeah, it's very interesting because there's uh, there's a clear focus on growth and inflation. And towards the end of last year, when we were bearish the dollar, there was a convergence with the rest of the world coming into the U.S. And U.S. exceptionalism basically peaked last year. Everyone now seems to be overlaying this, like, fading U.S. exceptionalism now, which I think is quite interesting because this is more about positioning and this is more about valuations that were extremely stretched in favor of the dollar. And then you get a, get, a, get a couple good data prints. But what we're seeing, if you start backtesting and trading FX strategies, the FX market basically just in, changed its focus entirely in March on inflation. So I think the one thing that's very interesting about the Fed is it's very asymmetric from a risk perspective right now. There is an election. It's the big elephant in the room. And there is no room for error for one inflation print to come in through the summer above expectations and still be able to reliably expect September uh, to actually be live. And if you take out September, then you have November and December. So how, how is the Fed going to cut in November around the election? And given the results of the election, how could the Fed potentially cut in December? And so the way that we're thinking about it from like a trading perspective is that you could have inflation kind of go back to the levels that people are comfortable with. But do you price in three hikes? Do you get more confident that you just get two? But you get one bad number, and that basically makes September a very tricky, tricky indicator, especially to trade it into the election. So I think a big part of this is we know that other G10 central banks are about to cut, but we're not very clear on whether the Fed can and whether they will. And I think the big driver here for, for the currency markets and for markets in general is inflation divergence. And that's what our models and our signals are telling us that we should be focused on. And Mark, there's tons to unpack there. It's the politics that stands out for me. What convinces you the politics and the election is so important? When we go back to 2012, September, they announced QE3. Why does it matter so much more this time? I think a big part of it is rights of inflation. So it's... We, we can see that you get policy actions and it's usually not a problem, but inflation is way above target. And so it's like this would be the first cut with very elevated inflation, a very tricky election where the polls are neck and neck and there's just a lot on the line. It's a very contentious election uh, just to even start. And I think the policy implications from one side or the other are so massive that the market is placing so much emphasis, especially for the FX market, because it, it is the most actionable way to look at the the presidential uh, implications in terms of tariffs, in terms of tax cuts. Those are two big things that are sitting on the table for next year. The corporate tax cuts will expire and the discussions around tariffs will remake the entire currency market. And this also fits into the story around the geopolitics, around capital flows, where, again, if you look at what's happening with the remedy, if you look at what's happening with currency markets like China and Russia and emerging markets are aligned where they are basically settling currency and remedy. They're finding ways to kind of nudge themselves away from the dollar. And this is why gold is trading at the levels that it's at. So there are so many implications for this. And so I think with this in mind, the easiest thing to think about is how much can the Fed cut into the election if inflation's still well above target? Stephanie, does the election matter? I mean, I think the, Fed, the Fed's in a tough spot. And they've been in a t tough spot all year. And I, Powell has indicated they're planning on... On, on, on cutting if the conditions are right. So it, it's purely on the last part of that statement, if the conditions are right, which means the core PC needs to be trending at about 0.2% month on month. And it's, as Mark mentioned, it, it has to go exactly right in order for the, for the Fed to cut. It, if they have a couple of missed prints in the next couple of months, then yeah, of course the Fed can't be cutting. But our base case is that you have a lot of conditions that should be continuously disinflationary between now and September, and then they'll be able to move. But at this point, they're kind of caught in a box and they have to just just go on what they've, they've indicated as, as key benchmark indicators. And if those things are consistent with the Fed cutting, then they're going to be cutting. No, regardless of what they do, they're going to be painted as politicized. So it's a, it's, a, it's a really tough one. So our base case is they can still cut in September. November's probably out. And then December is the next one.
But Stephanie, that's if inflation is on the trajectory lower. But if there's a move and a bigger softness in the labor market, that would give them this impetus and maybe some cover to cut into an election, do you think? Absolutely. If you started to see softness in the labor market, they, they would have every indication to cut. And this is different from where we were a year ago. At the beginning of, of 2023, they were in a position where inflation was so high that if we saw weakness in the labor market, they couldn't cut immediately. But now we're talking about 25 to 3% inflation. That's a much different backdrop than when inflation was, was trending significantly higher. So they're, they're now able to be a lot more nimble and, and even be able to cut interest rates, even if inflation is still a little bit sticky, and lean on the employment side of their mandate. Mark, you see that there's very little room for the Fed to be cutting rates, or it could, there, you could see them not end up cutting at all this year just simply because it's inconvenient timing. At the same time, you see a resurgent inflation as one of the biggest risks. So put that together in terms of what's going to be the main driver of either dollar strength or weakness. So, yeah, I'd say the last couple of months we flipped, we're, we're, we're quite bullish the dollar, especially against G10 currencies. I, I think they're, that is the backdrop that it's asymmetric, right? It's, it's like from a risk trading perspective, like our view is that the Fed is going, can cut. That's our, that's our economist baseline call. But I think when you think about the markets and how people have to, to deal with the risks around it, to me, the risk is if there's no room for error, and data is extremely volatile, and we constantly have to look at revisions, these kind of things to understand the trend. The trend in U.S. inflation is quite different from all the other countries that you track in the currency market. So I think the other implication is that the asymmetric kind of outcome is one where if you think about, again, the market was very excited that Fed, uh, the Powell said that there's no hikes. That's fine. Uh, but we weren't like, you know, starting this year, the market was talking about five or six cuts. And now we're saying it's OK that we don't get any hikes at all. or We don't have to have that narrative discussion around it. But I think if you think about it this way, if we do have a more volatile fall and inflation is generally sticky and the polls are kind of leaning towards kind of a change in leadership for the dollar, it has to price in the risk of tariffs. It has to price in the risk that corporate tax cuts will be extended. So in a very strong economy that's dealing with elevated inflation, you now have macro policy that's moving more inflationary. So the market will have to reprice the expectations, whether or not it evolves in that way, but it will have to basically reprice a narrative next year that is, you know, the rest of the world is cutting. Uh, the U.S. economy looks like it could get stronger. And the fact that you're adding tariffs makes it much more inflationary. So you kind of have to rethink the way that you look at the entire markets, particularly from the FX side. So for us, we are looking for a, a strong dollar against G10 currencies, but we also like the, the commodity story. So it's still a buffer for some emerging markets that are, are generally seen as exporters. But it is, again, kind of moving back into that terms of trade shock. It, and it's also a world where it kind of creates conditions where we were expecting financial conditions to ease this year to base uh, see the economy evolve in a better state. And if what we see is U.S. inflation and the Fed and the dollar creating a little bit of a tension around that, then we can't realize those financial conditions and we can't realize the growth expectations that were priced in this year for next year. So that's what starts to see the, the volatility increase. That's what starts to see carry trades unwind. This is kind of what adjusts uh, market sentiment. And I think these are the risks that we have to be really focused on. And that's why we're more bullish the dollar in the back half of the year. Stephanie, just to tease out one part that he was talking about, this idea that tariffs would mean that the dollar would essentially be stronger, that some of the protectionist policies that some people are talking about going, being implemented, especially if there is a change in leadership, would cause more inflationary pressures and would cause a stronger dollar because the Fed would have to remain higher for longer. Is that kind of an outcome that you agree with? I mean, it's certainly a difficult one. And that might be how the market prices the election initially. But face case... First of all, the tariffs wouldn't go into place into 2026 because that's when the TCJA expires. Second of all, it's possible that the, the labor market is actually in better balance by the time the election comes. So the Trump administration turning off some of the immigration flows might not actually be as inflationary as many fear. And by the way, the Biden administration has done a lot of spending themselves. So it, it's not actually in, 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 in entirely clear that if we do get a change in administration, you'll start to get a, a real pickup in spending. Either way, we're going to be getting tax cuts extended. The Trump or Biden administration in the next in the next cycle would be extending the tax cuts. It just depends if you carve out the, the upper income people, which is what the Biden administration would do. It's not going to be a boost to the economy, certainly when you're thinking about tax cuts, because it's, it's actually just extending what we have today. 
And the tariff one is, is a difficult one. And I, I would view that as more, certainly it could be dollar positive, but it would also be a, a, an environment where growth would likely weaken as well. The, the policies that Trump has, has alluded to with a 60% China tariff or 10% across the, the, the board tariff would be incredibly difficult for growth. So realistically, it's possible it wouldn't actually be that inflationary. The Fed should probably just pause, see what happens, and then they would likely react. So it, it's, not a, it's not as clear cut as Trump is inflationary and, and the, the Fed would no longer be able to cut in that environment. That's that not, that not necessarily the case. Mark, when it comes to tariffs and it comes to these tax cuts, both of these issues coming into play 2025, whether or not it's Biden or Trump, we're likely going to see more of the, sa the same. It just depends how aggressive they are going to be. So in that case, what do you have in terms of the direction of the dollar under a Trump 2025 or a Biden 2025? I think the part of it is that um, with Trump, it just creates more uncertainty, more volatility. And again, like the way the markets are trading, the currency market right now is they're actually trading. And I hear it a lot from client discussions. And it's really the fact that the rest of the world is improving right now is why people want to sell the dollar. And, I, and I'm, I, we're a bit confused about it because a lot of our leading indicators are kind of suggesting that the, the global economy is not accelerating it's kind of losing steam but there were some obviously some anecdotes as china's trying to clean up the housing market there you know the things are improving in the right direction there commodities are doing quite well across the board so maybe that's again part of the reflation uh pmis and manufacturing those things are bouncing back so people are excited about the global economy and the slowdown in the u.s and that is a, so you have to unpack it too as well because Laying out like slower growth and those type of things that would come from maybe a Trump administration is bullish dollar because it's risk off. Um, and then, you know, the, the world that the people are trading right now is kind of risk on. U.S. is slowing, but not by enough. And you can get Fed cuts. And this is dollar bearish. So I, I think what people are trying to figure out is which matters more, U.S. growth outperforming others, U.S. inflation being stronger. Therefore, the Fed has to react to that. Uh, or whether or not in, you know, in a Trump administration, does the rest of the world underperform? Like, do we get the rug kind of pulled out from us right now as the rest of the world seems like it's doing OK? Europe's leading indicators are improving. Does that all go away under a Trump, uh, uh, you know, kind of a Trump presidency, which is what we saw the first time around, which is the U.S. kind of outperformed the rest of the world. U.S. growth looked good. Because basically tariffs and the macro policies were administered basically slowed down the rest of the world. So I think that is kind of what people are trying to figure out is a high inflation kind of weak growth environment good for the dollar because we kind of move out of this Goldilocks environment. Everyone's moved back to Goldilocks. And I feel like any state we go through over the next six months is not Goldilocks. It's either it's it's something that's more volatile and, and the volatility. And again, there's you know, first order and second order effects. The first order effect is you basically price in the risk premium. Second order effect is we actually agree of like, if Trump wins, it, it's actually, you, you could see the dollar weaken dramatically after the first year. You could see the implementation of a new plaza accord, but those are a result of the fact that the dollar strengthens so much yeah. to price in the risk around these, these economic policies. Stephanie, you've been nodding, final word. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's a complicated backdrop. For now, it's going to be all about Fed policy and, and whether inflation can be consistent with the Fed being able to cut. The market's not going to be able to fully price in the election, certainly at least through, through much of the summer and, and probably not until the beginning of next year when we start to really understand what those policies mean. So for now, it's going to be all about whether the Fed can be a little bit more dovish, which arguably in the first quarter, we think we, we just passed peak hawkishness. It was all about the U.S. exceptionalism and, and inflation overheating. But if you just remember back to December, we were talking about the opposite. It was immaculate disinflation. We've just been swung around by the data. And it's really all about just looking through a lot of that noise. And what we're looking at is inflation running 25 to 3%, a little bit too sticky, but nothing that, that's that dramatic. And an economy that's starting to slow down a little bit. So for us, it does actually look fairly Goldilocks, at least for the next couple of months. Stephanie, this was great. It's good to see you. Stephanie Roth there of Wolf Research alongside Mark McCormick of TD Securities. Looking ahead to the data this week and the Fed speak as well. Bostick, Mester, Barr, Waller and Jefferson in the next 24 hours. This on Waller from City, Andrew Honhorst. Governor Waller's comments tomorrow may have more impact than stale minutes released on Wednesday. I think a lot of people would not as they listen to that. Let's give you an update on stories elsewhere this morning. Here is your Bloomberg Brief with Danny Berger. Hey, Danny. Hey, John. JP Morgan has lifted his
its full year net interest income to $91 billion versus the $90 billion it had predicted in its first quarter earnings release last month. The firm also raised its expense guidance for the year to $92 billion, but that's largely from a $1 billion donation that the bank made to its J.P. Morgan Chase Foundation. That new guidance comes ahead of its annual investor day in New York City. And testimony resumes today in the fraud and market manipulation trial of Bill Huang. Jurors have already heard witnesses say that Arquigo's capital lied to its Wall Street counterparties. Now, this week, the former chief risk officer, Scott Becker, is expected to take the stand. He'll be one of the prosecution's star witnesses. He was a key Arquigo's contact for the banks, and the jury has already been played recorded conversations where he reassures them that Huang's family office is fine, even as it's collapsing. Becker has pled guilty and will testify as a cooperating witness. And the NBA conference final matchups are set. Sadly, the Indiana Pacers beat the Knicks at MSG in a dominating Game 7 performance on Sunday. Now they take the top seed Boston Celtics. That series starts tomorrow night. And in the Western Conference, the Minnesota Timberwolves upset the defending champion Denver Nuggets. The Wolves came back from a 20-point deficit in the second half to take the series. They'll be facing the Dallas Mavericks in a series that starts on Wednesday. And that's your brief, John. Danny, thank you. Appreciate it. Up next on the program, setting you up for the day and a week ahead. That's just around a corner. You're open and bell, about 38 minutes away. Equity futures, just about positive. Thirty-six minutes away from the opening bow with equities just about positive on the S&P 500. On our radar, 45 minutes away from that open. How restrictive is Fed policy? I think that our stance is restrictive. Uh, one, another thing we do, we have surveys and I ask people all the time, do you think that our policy stance is preventing some things from happening that you would do otherwise? Every business leader says yes. That's what really gives me the confidence that uh, we can get inflation back to our 2%. Here's the trading diary for the day ahead. We'll hear from Fed's Chris Waller, Philip Jefferson and Loretta Mester, plus Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow speaking to the CEOs of Dell, NVIDIA and ServiceNow. Plus, it's JP Morgan's Investor Day. For a final word around the table, Amory, first to you. Well, I have an interview coming up in the next hour with Senator Ted Cruz and Senator Katie Britt, who's actually on um, Trump's VP shortlist. This is going to be about abortion and IVF and how the Republicans are really trying to actually change how the electorate thinks thinks about the Republican Party when it comes to those issues. Bramo? My takeaway is what's the bigger risk, an inflation resurgence or a weakening labor market? If everything's just fine, which is the sort of bigger tipping point? And what I thought was interesting today is people are kind of putting aside a weakening labor market despite some of the, uh, the population and some of what people are saying in terms of sentiment. And it really is the inflation resurgence. It's been the theme of the morning, hasn't it? I'm not sure how nervous that makes you that everything is just fine, apparently. Coming up tomorrow, here's your lineup. Max Kettner of HSBC, Claudia Saab of Saab Consulting, Morgan Stanley's Mike Wilson following this morning's big upgrade. And we'll catch up with Deutsche Bank's Matt Lazzetti. Looking forward to covering the week ahead with you. Thank you very much for choosing Bloomberg TV. This was Bloomberg Surveillance.